my name is Satyajit Sarkar, Satya for short. Um, I really, really thank uh, Pascal and the ASLM and MAP team for allowing me to just jump in at the last minute. But I just thought it was very, very relevant uh, to speak briefly about the uh, radar project, uh, which going forward in our phase two as well, uh, it will be of relevance and use to all the participants here. And I will, I'm mindful of the time because I've been an add-on onto this, so I'll keep it very brief. Happy to take questions and all later sometime whenever bilaterally. Okay, so RADAR project. RADAR stands for Regional AMR Data Analysis for Advocacy, Response, and Policy. It's one of three projects that are being run from the International Vaccine Institute, along with Captura, which is the counterpart to MAP in Asia, and also Equatia, in which we are a sub -grantee. RADAR is the only project amongst about 70 odd projects, which is focused totally on uh, the thematic domain of policy planning and advocacy. Uh, we are a One Health approach project. Uh, our scope is Asia and Africa. That means all the 22 countries. And we do look into AMR, AMU, and AMC. So let me just bring up a few slides and uh, hope you would appreciate what I'm trying to say. Can you see my slides? Uh, can someone confirm? One second, hold it. Wait, wait, share screen. Just give me a second, please. Right. I do hope you can see my slides. I'm presuming you can. Okay, this is actually the screen, the first slide of an event that we had a few days ago on 7th March. And it was a pilot that we had done uh, for for a capacity strengthening project on translating AMR data and evidence into effective policy. And we were sharing our lessons and insights from that project. It's a collaboration between RADAR and IVI and the Evidence Informed Policy Network of WHO. Now, the pilot was done in four countries, in Asia, Bangladesh, and Nepal, and in Africa, and Malawi, and Uganda. The purpose was to enhance technical skills and capacity in AMR knowledge translation, develop evidence brief for policy to increase demand by policymakers for data and evidence, establish the foundations for country level AMR knowledge synthesis and translation platform, and facilitate AMR data sharing and analysis within countries. Now, what that initiative looked like, now all of radar project throughout the COVID period was almost 100% uh, online, virtual. So we had to change our plans. So the initiative itself, which was a culmination of many things, ran for about four months from August to November. These were the topics that were covered. These workshops or webinars were three hours each, and the four countries were participating uh, that I mentioned earlier. Earlier, these workshops ran almost weekly, then bi-weekly, and then finally, a uh, little more time was given. The main outputs that came out from the four countries were four what we call formative evidence brief for policy. We only call it formative because it was done in a very compressed time. Uh, we also, by consultation and agreement, agreed to stick to human health uh, just so that we can manage it in, within the time because it was a pilot. Um, and strangely enough, even though the countries had the choice of choosing their own topics, all of them chose more or less the same topic tackling irrational use of antibiotics. Uh, following this, uh, over January and February, uh, we did a rapid qualitative assessment of this initiative. Idea was to basically take inputs and lessons for to scale this up and make it an offer from radar to all the rest of the 2022 countries uh, who are there, uh, who are the Fleming Fund priority countries. The other big thing that we did, which is also of uh, relevance, is that we created a policy advocacy country guide. And many of you people uh, participated in the co-development of it. It was a shared project, which we took inputs from everyone. And this will be out in another 10 days. We're just incorporating some final reviewer comments that we had got. It's a step-by-step -step guide. Now, these are some of the sections in that. And you will notice if you see step one, step two, and step six, there's a lot of discussions, tools, inputs 
on policy analysis, development, and implementation. This is so that countries can fully understand the policy process and then go into the advocacy component like step four and step five. So this guide is going to be out very, very soon. Completed it, we're just incorporating some final comments. Now, I'd like to share with you what is going to happen in Radar phase two, and we are responsive to uh, all the countries, uh, what their demands, emerging demands are. So the Radar phase two objectives are to improve AMR data and evidence, uh, establish mechanism to facilitate policy dialogue and create demand from uh, policymakers for policy relevant AMR data and analysis. Activities wise, there are two sections broadly. One is AMR knowledge translation capacity building. And that was what was the EVIPNET pilot all about in collaboration with WHO and another collab uh, collaborating center called K2P, which is based out of the American University in Beirut. So we hope to be supporting countries to develop their capacities for uh, translating um, uh, AMR uh, data and evidence into uh, policies, uh, establish knowledge synthesis and translation platforms in countries. And then we added two more elements which are new. Uh, we realized it would be very important to roll out a basic AMR socioeconomics analysis training. It will be a lecture series with case studies and similarly, uh, basic social behavioral analysis uh, capacity strengthening. Both of these two are basically, you can say, 101. So they'll be for developing some critical thinking around it so that, so that all the uh, policy work that, that we do will be informed by socioeconomics and the social behavioral dimensions. Then the other was to increase demand for data and promote uptake. So the rollout of the policy advocacy guide that we have, we'll be converting into training workshops and we'll be offering that. And then we're going to set up an, a very exciting media fellowships program where we hope to engage with about four to five health and development journalists in each of the countries. So potentially up to 100 journalists uh, to support policy advocacy within those countries. We had also, and these are our TORs. These are our TORs that we have got from Fleming Fund Motmac uh, for phase two. Uh, and we'll be uh, detailing these out over the next six months or so. We also had suggested that we'd like to do two more things, but these we have been asked to keep on hold till uh, further discussions as because both of them are actually not in, in, the, in the remit of uh, Fleming Fund. That was a proof of concept for piloting a, a AMR social behavioral surveillance system that would link the technical with the social. And the other on, on a topic that Ramanan is going to speak on later today, uh, is, is sort of a small pilot initiative to try and use real world uh, 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 data, vaccine data primarily and AMR data for estimating the potential impact of current and new vaccines in mitigating AMR. Now, for each of these, actually we did an opinion poll some weeks back and about 140 respondents from 21 countries responded. But I'm going to show you only one graph. We have lots of graphs, but I'm going to show you only one. Uh, what was the priority and the interest level for that EVIPNET business? So the question asked to them was, how interested would your country be in doing this capacity building initiative uh, for translating AMR evidence into policy making? Uh, on the right, uh, on the left side, the leftmost column is for all respondents, then it, Africa, and then it's Asia. As you can see, there's a very high interest in this offering that we will be putting out to countries in phase two. And the priority level is also close to 80%, so which is great. So we hope that most of the countries would be interested in participating in this. We'll be reaching out to all of you uh, in our scoping exercise. So thank you very much. I've kept it brief as I promised Pascal, uh, as she let me in at the very last minute, but I hope this would have been useful for you. And there were at least Jonathan from Uganda and Vati Paso from Malawi who participated in the pilot. You may want to talk with them more for uh, seeing how the experience was. So thank you very much for allowing me this opportunity. Well, so thank you very much, uh, Dr. Satya. That was very, very informative. You know, having data is one thing, but you know, synthesis of those data and utilizing them to inform like evidence-based antimicrobial therapies, informing our treatment guidelines, but also informing our infection prevention and control approaches in our respective countries, so, so critical. So we are very grateful for you. 
Now we have again a, a, a bit of an amendment. So before Dr. Pascal is, I would like to call uh, Dr. Ramanan, who is also online, uh, so that he can take us through the, uh, through the, a case of AMR surveillance to inform vaccine uh, deployment. So colleagues who are in the IT and coordination team, can you kindly allow Dr. Ramanan to take the floor? Hi everyone. Uh, good morning, uh, and uh, you know, a pleasure to be there virtually. Uh, I'm actually at a different meeting, and I could only join for about ten minutes this morning. So, uh, uh, thanks, Pascal, for organizing this meeting, uh, and I think this is a useful conversation about what the next stage of Fleming is really going to look like. And I think a simple, uh, you know, sort of uh, way to think about the surveillance data is that we have a lot of surveillance data, but unless we uh, unless we know exactly how we're going to deploy it, the energy uh, to keep collecting the surveillance data is going to be quite limited. Uh, and maybe as long as there's some external funding, it'll continue. But we need to create the momentum within countries for continuing to collect data. And that will only come if the data are actually useful. And this is one of the ways in which we think they might be useful. So vaccines and MR, this is uh, work that's being presented on behalf of a, uh, a consortium that was... Uh, based on a three-way partnership between the World Health Organization, the Gates Foundation, and the One Health Trust, uh, and included uh, uh, you know, a whole range of, uh, of university partners uh, that were involved in this work. And uh, to date, we have about, I think now about 12 papers, uh, all talking about how to think about antibiotic resistance and vaccines. And this is the first sort of large-scale body of work published in high-impact journals which really looks at how much you can tackle the problem of AMR using vaccines. And, uh, you know, happy to share, you know, the, uh, the slides here. And of course, the, the papers are all online as well. Um, now, the idea about, and, and these cover a range of pathogens. They cover everything from, you know, uh, pneumococcal, Shigella, uh, influenza, um, uh, rotavirus, uh, typhoid, uh, so, uh, and, and tuberculosis when there is a vaccine. So it covers both existing and, and new vaccine. And also, you know, things like RSV, where we have a vaccine that's coming up quite soon, uh, not quite there, but we need to understand whether it'll have any impact on AMR at all. So uh, vaccination, uh, the effect on antimicrobial resistance is through the following pathways. One is that vaccination results in fewer infections, and uh, that reduces disease burden, less transmission, and you save lives that way. Uh, so you're just preventing resistant infections to begin with, so you don't even have to deal with them. The second is that you have less antibiotic use and reduce selection pressure, and therefore you also have less resistance and you have life saved. So uh, you have fewer infections, you have fewer drug-resistant infections, so you're able to save the last resort antibiotics. You also have fewer viral infections. A lot of the vaccines that we evaluated are not bacterial vaccines, they're viral vaccines, because those are the cases in which antibiotics are used inappropriately most of the time. And also, uh, you know, there are secondary bacterial infections which you can prevent through vaccination. So uh, not to oversell vaccines, but I think we've underused vaccines as a pathway to deal with AMR. Uh, this, is, uh, um, uh, this is one modeling study, uh, which is an important one because Klebsiella pneumonia is now the leading cause of, uh, of mortality due to neonatal sepsis. Uh, in children worldwide. And you can see this from, uh, from either the Barnard study or the CHAMP study or the NEOOB study, all three large-scale studies covering a whole range of LMIC settings. And you can see that the percentage of new neonatal sepsis mortalities with Klebsiella infection ranges from a low, you know, in some countries, you know, less than 10%, but to as much as 70%, uh, depending on the country. Um, so I think this is an important uh, uh, you know, place where the antibiotics are failing because drug-resistant Klebsiella infections are really quite important. And so the development of a vaccine, uh, a maternal vaccine that confers uh, immunity to the, to the newborn is really going to be quite helpful. So we've, we've done work on the percentage of neonatal deaths and total uh, newborn deaths of due to sepsis that are avoidable with a maternal vaccine across countries. I'm just presenting one study that I was also called in at the last minute for this uh, meeting. So I have, I don't, I, we have a much longer presentation on this. Um, 
And you can see that resistance distribution of vaccine avertable deaths is also quite high. So there's a lot of of the of the deaths that would be averted that are of resistant infections, regardless of WHO region, and uh, also of uh, you know overall vaccine avertable deaths. So because they, most of these are are resistant to multiple antibiotics, and this is the projected global impact of just this one vaccine, a maternal Klebsiella vaccine. And as you can see from the top left, um, the largest impact is going to be in South Asia, but also in Sub-Saharan Africa, and uh, also in parts of of, of Latin America. Um, now, uh, that's that's just the Klebs yellow vaccine. We also have a lot of work on the RSV vaccine, RSV, uh, you know, respiratory disease, which is mostly in children where it causes the most damage, but also in adults. And we have systematic trial data which show that, uh, you know, ch children who were in an intervention arm of a vaccine trial had almost 13% lower incidence of antimicrobial prescribing over the first three months than a placebo. And vaccine efficacy was almost 17% against antimicrobial prescriptions. So in other words, if you gave the vaccine, you were able to reduce the antimicrobial prescriptions by about 17%. So it's not just one vaccine that's going to do the trick, but it's going to be a multiplicity of vaccines. And uh, of course, you know, the maternal vaccination prevents about five courses per 100 infants in LMICs, which is about 10% of all antimicrobial prescribing, which is, you know, a significant amount. And remember that with vaccines, you don't have to engage in behavior change with respect to telling people don't prescribe. Not that that is not important, that is very important. But this is one way in which we can tackle AMR without having to engage in a large-scale behavior change program, because that is also going to be needed. And uh, lower respiratory tract infections account for, you know, almost 70% of all antimicrobial prescribing that's prevented by maternal vaccination. Uh, so these are the, the, the results. These were published in PNAS last year on how much you can prevent with a placebo versus the RSV vaccine. So you have less prescriptions, uh, you know, at all sort of days uh, of life in the first uh, 90 days of life and, uh, and fewer L LRTI diagnoses. Uh, and in fact, in, 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 even for any diagnosis, you said get to get to have a benefit from the uh, from these, and you have fewer antimicrobial prescribe uh, prescriptions per live born infant. Now, uh, getting to the point of this entire talk, like I said, you know, there's a huge literature now which didn't exist three years ago. We didn't know much about this. We just kept talking about vaccines and AMR. But today, we have, like I said, eleven or twelve papers that cover this area really quite well. Now, where does the surveillance data fit in? Where does Fleming and this work really fit in? I think the surveillance data are going to be quite important in guiding the vaccination programs. So first of all, they can indicate when vaccines are needed to tackle AMR. So uh, some of you may be familiar with the example of drug-resistant typhoid in Zimbabwe, Pakistan, and Liberia, and, and the introduction of the typhoid conjugate vaccine to tackle drug-resistant typhoid. So already, vaccines are being used to tackle AMR. This is not something in the future. It's already happening now. But how do we get to know early enough that we need to introduce a vaccine so that we don't go through a period of 10 years like Zimbabwe did, struggling with typhoid outbreaks before a vaccine is finally introduced in 2019? I think the way to do that is by having a strong surveillance program. And I think the surveillance program needs to be geared towards helping us guide these vaccine introduction decisions. So they can also help with uh, another bit, which we've not done yet, which is on prediction of AMR burden. Where are we going to see AMR the most? It's not geographically homogenous, it's very heterogeneous. Some places you'll have more than others. And if we would allow for early vaccine introduction. And the third thing is really on targeted vaccination. All these vaccines are not necessary everywhere. They may be important, in certain places and at certain times. As we move away from the blockbuster diseases like uh, pneumococcal pneumonia, like, uh, uh, you know, to some extent rotavirus, but, but really, you know, things like Hib, you're getting into bacterial pathogens and viral pathogens that are affecting much smaller proportions of the population. So it's, it's very likely that the next set of vaccines, whether it's for MRSA or Klebsiella, or even to some extent RSV, they might not necessarily be needed universally. They may be needed in specific geographies at particular points in time. And uh, having the information to be able to guide that vaccination and prioritization is important. It also saves a lot of costs so that we're not vaccinating a whole bunch of people who don't really need to get the vaccination because vaccination programs also are expensive. They also 
you know, have, uh, you know, adverse events following immunizations and all of that. So I think what we need to do is understand where our AMR problem is and then deploy these tools. And I've only talked about vaccines, but uh, there's greater now development of monoclonal antibodies, which again are a very expensive uh, enterprise. So we can use monoclonals, but you don't want to use monoclonals all over the place. You want to be very careful about where we use them uh, because of, of the high cost of these. And here again, uh, I think MAP2 can be quite useful in thinking about where this information is useful. Now, the way in which we tend to think about information, value of information, is that information is valuable when you know why you're collecting that information, when you know what policy change you're trying to influence with that information. And that's what I would uh, say is, is possibly where this is useful. So in summary, I think vaccines, both bacterial and viral, can significantly reduce antimicrobial consumption and drug resistant cases. I think we now have a lot of systematic evidence from this, a lot of it drawn from trial data, from, uh, from actual data where the vaccines have deployed on the ground, uh, and any policy to increase coverage of existing vaccines and to introduce approved vaccines. And third, also to invest in the development of new, new vaccines are very feasible ways to help tackle antimicrobial resistance. And, uh, and importantly for this conversation, I think surveillance data are going to be very important to guide these vaccine introduction and prioritization decisions based both on current resistance rates, but also on projections of where these are going to be. So uh, with that, I will stop here and uh, happy to take a couple of questions. Uh, yeah, I have another three minutes, I guess. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. X, for your insightful presentation. And it is indeed true that, you know, if we indulge into vaccination, we largely avert the vaccine preventable uh, deaths in our setting. Because, you know, once you prevent, then you're good rather than just waiting for the kids to succumb from, for example, neonatal sepsis, neonatal meningitis. You know, once a child has neonatal sepsis or meningitis, then that's like an emergence and the outcome is usually adverse. So I think indulging in two vaccination would be really an area where we should uh, direct our effort, and especially in the low and middle income countries, like, like sub-Saharan African countries, but also the Southeastern Asian countries. So thank you for that. And the... Now, let me now welcome uh, uh, the next presenter. And the next presenter is uh, Dr. Pascal Leondor. Uh, she'll be taking us from, uh, to a topic titled From AMR Data to Action. What should MAP2 look like? Because uh, Dr. Pascal had been with us since day one. So then she'll tell us now, how was it in these uh, couple of years? And where are we really projecting to go? So welcome, Doc, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and good morning, everyone. Uh, so this will be a shared presentation with Dr. Wande from, from Africa CDC. And indeed, uh, we are going to think together on what this map uh, phase two uh, would look like. So I, I hope that everyone uh, understands that the two presentations that we squeezed in the program this morning was really to uh, broaden our perspective on what could be, uh, you know, some, some of the goals and purposes of a map phase two. So one of, of, of them is putting our data into action through policy. So this is what Dr. Satya uh, presented. What are some of the things they are doing in, in other countries and, and uh, in, in, in their own uh, program? And the other presentation from Dr. Raman, and really a brilliant presentation on vaccine and how some of the surveillance effort could actually be targeted to uh, inform uh, the vaccine development or, or deployment. So from data to action, this is really the core of the map. We have been generating data, uh, and now we, we need to bring them into, uh, into action. So the slides that I'm going to present are the same uh, that uh, the one I, I presented on day one, and I just want to bring them um, a little bit uh, further. So some of the proposed information, uh, the proposed intervention to to uh, include in the NAPS. This is uh, the slide from, from yesterday. And here I wanted to tag where some of those interventions could, uh, could be addressed. So for example, we said we have to continue to increase the volume, 
the quality, the relevance, and representativeness of lab data, and increase the percentage of lab from the more or less 1% to 50%. And I think this is something that can be addressed under EQA Africa. Why, and as well as promoting the AST at lower level of the laboratory network. But when we talk about increasing the digitization and integrity of data, through LIS, expand the WhoNet, have other IT solutions, etc. This could be addressed as part of the map or as part of the course because there's a big uh, component of, of education. When we talk about clear measures of success and key performance uh, uh, indicator for AMR control, then again, uh, under the map, uh, we could uh, address some of this as well as uh, the course. So this again was, um, was um, presented yesterday. So attack them again. Update and enforce national essential medicine list based on the evidence that, that the map will continue to generate. So we had a start uh, with collecting the data on antimicrobial consumption. Through the map, we could refine those uh, strategies, we could expand them so that we really have the evidence of what is missing in the essential medicine list in terms of antibiotics and how can we make sure that uh, they, they, they actually are aligned to uh, the disease uh, burden and the AMR trends and rates. Um, adapt the surveillance protocols to the reality. So we know that we have very few bacteriology laboratory, even uh, uh, less that are capable of doing antibiotic susceptibility testing. So we need to consolidate this cohort of AMR Sentinel sites. So that is something that EQA Africa would largely address. Um, and in addition to routine surveillance, maybe we have to roll out special protocols. And we say it, for example, measuring AMR in community settings, or like Dr. Ramanan was saying, you know, there can be some, some surveillance case really specifically to address issues like, like the vaccine or address specific uh, cases like neonatal uh, uh, sepsis. So that can be addressed through the map. And of course, there is a, a component, a large component of education and training that can be taken by uh, the course. So we included as well some pathogen genomic use cases. I think uh, the Fleming Fund has the Sick Africa. There's also a component of, of training and data in there. Further consolidate country ownership and capacity in data collection and analysis. So we said we would strengthen the capacity, role, and responsibility of the Sentinel site and the private laboratory. Basically, we know that an AMR surveillance network should have the reference lab, the Sentinels, and then you have the laboratory at the, 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 the clinical and the community interface. But are the roles and responsibility clearly defined? And really, do we have uh, SOPs and guidelines that are really practical so that everyone knows uh, what they have to do? So that's something that EQA Africa could address while bridging the knowledge and skill gap in utilizing the data could be done through an African knowledge hub. I will we'll detail that in the next slides. And that should include the development of investment case. When we have those data, I think Dr. Tochi and, and Dr. Watipaso yesterday say, read the report and bring it into, into action. How much does things cost and how do we prioritize our intervention? So instead of having the NAPs with 50 intervention really going across all the five uh, areas that have been suggested by the O'Neill report, can we really prioritize based on what is the most likely to work and, and, and what is the most cost effective? So now I will let Dr. Wande uh, speak to the terms of reference for a map phase two, uh, which have been developed specifically to address some of these questions. Thanks, Pascal, and good morning once again, colleagues. Uh, so very quickly, um, uh, please note that uh, we are presenting this, but we would very much like to get your input. Um, we'll have a really good discussion um, during the group sessions. So primarily, um, the terms of reference proposed by Fleming Fund for Phase 2 is something that many of you have really said, expand. Uh, 14 is an amazing number, but of course, we need to expand uh, beyond uh, the 14 countries. We have 55 um, AU member states, and as a continent, we need to be able to say we have good um, sort of a regional representation. Uh, so primarily to explore the feasibility of including other countries, what does this really mean? Um, I'm knowing fully well that some countries are already doing um, some sort of uh, uh, AML surveillance. 
We also need to establish mechanisms, primarily uh, for capacity building. Uh, one crucial thing that uh, I'm really, we are really pleased to see uh, through MAP, through EQA and QAS, is that workforce development. Uh, the continent uh, really needs, and, and our countries really need to uh, uh, strengthen their workforce. So uh, thinking about things like uh, the, the workshops, having uh, super, uh, supportive mentorship or supervision to improve data quality analysis, management, data sharing issues, um, as well as improve the data flow. Thinking about uh, the inclusion of non-Fleming Fund supported sites, uh, I think uh, um, um, in the previous slide, uh, Pascal really alluded to that. Uh, many of the countries, and I'm sure that many of you will agree in your countries, that the private sector really takes a chunk of healthcare. Uh, beyond uh, private sectors, I think even faith-based uh, organization, uh, like in Kenya, yeah, I know that they're very uh, strong faith-based uh, hospitals and laboratories providing care uh, for the uh, collection of AMR and AMU data. Next, we look at um, improving uh, data use. And this, in this, um, it's really to use data to support countries to establish systems that are functional, thinking about monitoring quality and capability across the human health AML surveillance system, and again, to include non-Fleming um, Fund uh, supported sites, uh, that would be your uh, private uh, laboratories and other laboratories. Uh, thinking about, um, addressing uh, the use of systems and processes and evidence. Um, I'm thinking about uh, the tools requires, um, policy strategies in place um, that have already been developed by MAP phase one. How can we then use these resources? We have built a setting capacity. You already have processes. You have data flow mechanisms. You have already done some data sharing agreement. So how can we turn this um, sort of retrospective work that we have done into something that can be prospective to guide uh, some of your policy interventions? Um, to assist and support countries to develop data collection protocols and analysis processes that ad answer specific needs, such as AML surveillance in the communities. I think uh, a lot of um, times when we talk about this data, many people say, but it, it's not really representative of the population. And that is quite um, um, true. So it's important for countries, for us to work with countries to develop uh, protocols that bring, um, um, that gives us data um, closest to the community. Beyond that, I think something that that has been coming out also is um, um, HI surveillance in hospitals. Um, ideally should fit into your AML surveillance system. It's not a parallel system. So how do we then work to develop protocols, uh, data flows, uh, mechanisms, as well as analysis process to address some of these issues? Um, this is the third one, and it's on um, improving data production and quality. I think um, 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 Pascal is going to be talking a bit about how um, the knowledge of is going to look like. Um, the, um Theory of change, I think that's what it's called. The theory of change for what a knowledge orb would look like. I think um, data is important, but how do we then analyze and use data? And I'm glad that Dr. Tuchi has even given some examples on how data can drive our policy. Uh, thinking about the, um, the knowledge orb primarily would be able to help us complement the effort already being done in countries um, in developing local capacity for quality data production, collection, analysis, trans, um, in interpretation, as well as dissemination. Strengthen AML and system capability and quality data at country level in a format useful for local policy makers and practitioners. Um, one of the things that uh, I think is really important for us to highlight, yesterday Dr. Tochi mentioned uh, the fact that the Minister of Health uh, really flagged um, the findings from the map in the Oman meeting. We were also present in the Oman meeting. But what that has changed is during the Oman meeting, uh, the EU presidency picked interest on AMR, primarily on how Africa is doing and other lower middle income settings. So for us now, we are able to use some of these findings to channel advocacy at high level meetings like the AU, the G7 meetings, the uh, G20 meetings. As a matter of fact, our acting director was in Sweden with the EU presidency uh, just last week. And one of the things that we talked about was some of the data and some of the findings of the work done by MAP, EQA Africa, and Quas. Um, lastly, is really to pr um, production of sufficient quality data, a true expanded capacity of the Sentinel sites. I think Sentinel sites is something that has been coming out a lot in our discussions and the potential engagement with the private sector. Now I'll hand over to Dr. Pascal for the next. 
So I thought I would put in a, in a kind of diagram, you know, when we say a knowledge hub or when we, when we want to explain what the second phase of MAP would be. So what we have done in phase two, we really have taken the data that were somewhere in computers, they were on papers, they were hidden, and what have we done? We have brought those data onto computers. And that has been done more or less by, by, by the MAP scientists. I mean, we had teams on the ground. I mean, although they were local collectors, this has happened with the consortium scientists. So those data are on the computer. That means there is a MAP store that, that you know. There, is, uh, there are overall da data sets. Uh, each country have, uh, uh, have, has access to the data sets and, and, the country, uh, and the country report that we shared yesterday. So discussing with you, you know that we had a round of engagement after the report, and we asked, OK, do you have uh, any feedback, what have you been doing with the report? So we are very uh, proud and excited that some of those results have gone to that meeting in Oman, etc. But we feel that there is still a need for the country to, to really fully uh, take advantage of those data sets. So what should be the next step? So the next step would be to, to have those data into policy and action by the country themselves. So we know that now the capacity is a little bit contrasted. Some countries might have really the capacity, others may not have. And that's why we thought of having a hub where we would pool resources, knowledge, protocols, and system, whereby we would, we would sort of transition whatever the MAP consortium has done to bring the data into the computer, and now help the country to bring those data into policy and action. What does that mean? That means really building economic cases with the data, uh, geospatial analysis, when we say we want to have Sentinel site, can we help you to really, with GIS data and population density, to place your capacity, your lab capacity, or or whichever capacity, maybe the workforce, to make sure that you cover uh, the population needs. Uh, the visualization, for example, on the, on the resistance maps, uh, One Health Trust has a good system. That could be one of the, of the resources that you can use, because as a policymaker, to see where the AMR is on the map is, is, is extremely powerful. Uh, the drivers of AMR, so we could just slightly touch it, with the data because the data were very fragmented. But to understand that certain AMR is, is more within a certain age group or, or, or within a certain uh, um, geographic uh, uh, area is extremely powerful to, to target the intervention. Uh, the AMR prevalence in the communities, I think that came back uh, several times. And the monitoring and evaluation based on new KPI. So I think that it's, it's you know, the, the DRI came yesterday. It may, I mean, it's an interesting indicator it may or may not be useful. But importantly, I think that came with uh, Dr. Chanceline when she said, you know, at which level do we need to get worried about resistance? Is it at 5%, 15%, 50%? What, you know, what, what are some indicators to, to tell us that we, we are either achieving or failing or we should change our, our, our processes? So that would be the phase two. That would really be uh, the goal. So the phase two, and you could see that some, some of these uh, goals have been highlighted even by Dr. Satya. And this is why we would like that uh, the map really aligns with what we do on the QAS, under the education, EQ Africa, obviously with the Sentinel site capacitation, with the radar that does a lot about, about policy. I think it's, uh, it, it's, it's more with the journalists, with, with the training, and for us it's more really making the data speak uh, for, for the policy maker. I, I did Seek Africa uh, that, that deals with uh, the pathogen genomics. I think that uh, there's a lot of potential for collaboration. And where you see the FFFs, that's the Fleming Fund uh, Fellowship, obviously um, the pool of trainees under the fellowship are really, because they are part of the, of the national system, they would be very instrumental to turn these uh, uh, data into uh, action. And I think I also put the country grant there because there's a need to further align uh, this uh, processes with whatever is happening uh, in the country grant to, to um, improve the synergy. So I will give it back to you. <laughs> <laughs> so back to me. So um, policy, uh, data for policy is one of the um, uh, things I champion. So I think uh, primarily um, the question is how can you then use this fantastic report that you all received yesterday to make a change? not just in your countries, but also in your regions, uh, East Africa, West Africa, Southern Africa, Central Africa, uh, and as well as the continent. 
So primarily a few things that we hope that our discussions, our very rich group discussion will address is, can this report uh, become annual reports that can feed into a regional continental repository? How can the data be even more relevant and directly feed into your NAP process? I think we are quite pleased every time we hear that uh, countries are reviewing their NAP uh, and they're really referencing the map data or, or they're putting the quas uh, bit of it um, as part of the workforce. I think that's quite impressive and that's really the whole essence of the consortium, all of the work that we have been doing uh, as Africa CDC in collaboration with ASLM. Can more complex questions be answered answered through other types of analysis. I mean, we, I mean, we have an idea of the capacity of the lab. We've been able to pull percentages. Um, I think we, we, we're able to even predict or say, uh, true modeling, this is what will happen in the next 10 years if no investment is made. But I think there are critical things that you need as AMRCCs. Um, every time you um, say you present the data, what does this mean to a policymaker? You need to be able to make strong investment case. And this is where your economic um, sort of angle for AML data really comes. What is the cost of inaction? What is the cost benefit of having uh, bacteriology labs or AML surveillance in place? What is the cost benefit of having infection prevention and control? Or for example, the use of vaccines uh, to reduce AMR. Um, a few others would be, can the quality and volume of data feeding into your annual reports increase? And this is one of the things that uh, I think we had flagged in previous slide, and be used for the more accurate and representative results. And lastly, how can data be used to drive policy, financing, and interventions for AML control? Uh, so for example, uh, what is the most cost-effective intervention that Zambia should be focusing on? given the current context of Zambia. I think this is quite important that the findings from this uh, can really drive context-specific interventions as well as in investments. I think um, just uh, this is my last slide is um, one of the things that uh, came out strongly and thank you so much Wati Paso uh, for really putting Africa CDC and ASLM on the spot yesterday is uh, so much has been said about the amazing work that the AMLCCs are doing and we really applaud your effort but there is still more to be done. You're overwhelmed in terms of the, your nine to five, what you have to do. But it's also important for us to create enabling environment, support you with the required tools, um, 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 systems in place. So one of the things that um, um, we are started to brainstorm about is um, sort of um, a leadership uh, program or mentorship program for the AMRCCs via Africa CDC. Uh, could be an exchange program, um, thinking about things like policy, how to use policy, how to do strong advocacy, uh, which uh, many of you would be familiar with the work we do in Africa CDC, that we are able to really do that. Uh, but beyond that is that community. And I think we are quite proud of how you have all interacted. Um, it's creating a community uh, for um, the AMRCCs to establish a community of practice uh, where you can turn country AML surveillance data into policy and investment case. I think one of the things that we also want to highlight is also the potential for a South-South exchange uh, uh, program. I think we're quite pleased and thank you so much Olga and to the Ethiopian team. One of the things that are, are through a different uh, funding mechanism um, that we will be doing uh, next month is an exchange program where our colleagues uh, from Ethiopia would be going to NICD to uh, go through like a, a week-long uh, process of learning how uh, the NICD's um, AML surveillance uh, system works in South Africa. And that is very important for us uh, because one of the best ways is really to exchange best practices, um, challenges which are quite similar in our settings and how to address them. So very, uh, very quickly, the lab uh, committee. <laughs> All right. So, uh, so the next slide is really to, you know, we, we were trying to be very creative and can we uh, uh, capacitate the AMRCC in the same model like we have the SLM LabCorp? And I think, are there anybody here? Do you know the LabCorp? Can you raise your hand if you know the LabCorp? All right. Yes. Okay. So I think it's a very popular program of, of, of ASLM and most of the countries here participate, I think, maybe at the exception of Senegal. So you know our theory of action of LabCorp, right? We are funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates. And what we do in LabCorp is not is capacitate groups 
at the coordination level of a country. And we have done that uh, primarily for the viral load, but, but, but uh, later for, for all sorts of, of diagnostic. And what we do in the lab cop, we define steps in diagnostic cascade. We do regular assessments uh, of, of the system. Then we help the country to prioritize challenge, identify what works and what doesn't work uh, in, in, in several settings. Then we have that community of practice, the technical working group, the clinician, the labs. And then what do we do? We take the result of those assessments and then we help the country to have investment case and then they submit either to the Global Fund or to the PEPFAR. And like that, we hope to increase uh, access to diagnostic, improve patient outcome and laboratory system functionality. And I try to, to, to imagine what would it look like for Could we as we have done in MAP, generate even more relevant AMR data. Together through the Knowledge Hub, analyze the trend drivers and gaps, and then prioritize the most critical intervention, identify best practices on the continent, maybe through exchange uh, 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 program, and then the community of practice of the AMRCC, which represent uh, the One Health and probably some implementing partners and, and a country grantee, could come together and through this grant, we would help the country then to have either the national operational plan for, for the NAP, uh, you know, take uh, the, 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 the result and the implication of what we find in the surveillance and then implement the best practices, have the funding requests, have the investment case. And that would be, the outcome would be better containment of AMR that could be measured uh, through indicators, maybe the DRI, maybe other indicators. Uh, we could uh, uh, monitor access to antibiotic, lower AMR rate, etc. And in that way, we could really structure how we can capacitate uh, the AMRCC across the continent. So that's uh, the last slide I wanted to show you. So thank you very much. And um, so I think that we can open for a few questions before uh, going into, into the group. Uh, so while the tech team, yeah. We have slides for the group. So thank you very much. I think you're right, Pascal. I think we, if you could get, get some, just a few questions, uh, yeah for question comment or maybe some recommendations. So, so quickly, so quickly and straight to the point. Madam from Nigeria. Thank you very much. The, thank you, Wendy. I had actually um, ticked up that um, annual report on the map. I got it and I said, is this an annual report? But now I get the sense that um, it's something that if we get it right, can, can form the, the template for an annual report. I, I am completely in favor of that. And also, thank you for proposing um, that support for the AMRCCs. It is really uncharted waters for so many people, and um, it would be great if this can, can be implemented for sharing ideas for the AMRCCs. It's highly needed. So thank you very much for that. So th thank you for that uh, comment. So I take from Uganda, and then uh, next, and then here. Yeah. Quickly. So quickly and to the point. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, I think this is the right time to air out uh, my comments. Uh, I've taken note of them yesterday. Uh, thank you very much for the continuation phase that is proposed. Uh, but uh, as it was discussed yesterday, many countries in here have implemented their NAPs. We started from scratch. We didn't know how to do better. And perhaps for the time of four years, five years, we have learned lessons. And then we hopefully think that in the next review, there are new things that we can incorporate for us as lessons learned. In way, way back home, we have learned that there are so many things we never anticipated. For example, the kind of passive sentinel surveillance cannot yield the data that you would, you, you would require to inform policy because of the unstandardized approaches across sites, incapacities, and variations. So our National Action Plan proposed uh, continuous complementary surveys 
which could be not skewed but could guide on, for example, like the syndromic surveillance and the non-syndromic, the hospital acquired and the non-hospital acquired. So that helps us to make sure that the data we have is informative and can inform policy, other than because politician, if you come out and say ampicillin is no longer working, the politician would want to knock it off in a knee-jerk kind of reaction, which in turn can be uh, uh, negative. Um, uh, also, in the next phase, uh, I think this goes to MOT, we have created capacities in terms of competencies in human resources, specifically skewed for microbiology. We would, it would be ideal that the next phase of implementation for Fleming Fund incorporates the capacities of like the fellows, like the quas, and this must be a prerequisite for any country grantee who takes over from, from, from for, 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 the, for, for the Fleming Fund. And you don't want to duplicate efforts, but you want to sustain from the previous investments. That would be very good uh, to sustain the momentum. Uh, and another thing which you have not mentioned is diagnostic stewardship. Diagnostic stewardship is key to address the AMR challenges. It brings, for example, this, the protocol we are designing has also the other aspects of diagnostic stewardship for clinicians. If we base it on a lab, they will say that's a lab work. And yet, AMR, for us to address AMR, we have to holistically address it at facility level. All players must be on board. I don't want to be the speaker for the day. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for bringing, especially on the last part on diagnostic stewardship. I think that's very critical. I remember again, we'll have time to discuss more in the parallel session. So let's just be straight to the point. So briefly, and then we finish with this doctor in front here. So please. Okay. Welcome. Yeah, thank you, um, um, Sati Gulugun from Nigeria. Um, just like uh, it was highlighted uh, since yesterday, that you know data is very key for policy uh, object and also plans. And like I mentioned yesterday, because um, we are talking about one health. And most of the presentation and the data that you know is presented here is only on the human health uh, uh, sector, and we know that you know in the animal health sector there is poor regulation of uh, and use of antimicrobials, and it's a very very big issue in the animal health sector. And we don't have this data. And I thought that uh, it's, uh, it was going to appear, or it's going to appear in the second phase of the, uh, the project, but I didn't quite see anything on that. So how do we, you know, intend to get this on board? Thank you. Thank you. Then Dr. Yenon, please. Yeah, um, uh, thank you. Thank you, Pascal, uh, Wendy, for... Uh, and all the presenters this morning. So um, I think it's encouraging to see that, you know, phase two will be uh, a prospective data collection where um, we have a control on many things, including, you know, completeness of data and so on. So it's great to see that we are moving in that direction. Um, so from, uh, from phase one uh, data collection, we understood that um, there were gaps in terms of, for example, clinical information with your antimicrobial resistance data. So um, I think I would like to see really, you know, some deliberate attempts in terms of, yeah, in terms of, um, um, you know, our effort in making, you know, in collecting clinical information in your sentinel sites, uh, where we we involve, you know, other um, other actors like clinicians in addition to working in the lab. That is one. And then in terms of the lab capacity, so we saw that um, priority pathogens were not detected consistently in, in most of those 14 um, African Union member states. Um, so I think this may be the time, for example, as you, as you said, you know, EQ Africa to, to make a deliberate attempt in terms of capacity building, uh, bringing you know, some minor missing elements in terms of um, biochemical tests or antibiotics or some additives 
so that we also increase you know, the capacity of the lab to, to isolate other, um, other pathogens. And then um, when I see the duration of this project, so it will be for the next three or four years, um, which means that I think we cannot really spend you know, all of these four years collecting data again. Um, so I expect you know, some, um, some interventions in terms of um, using our interim data to influence policy um, and, and you know, focus also in engaging clinicians on development of guidelines on, on uh, treatment of bacterial infections and then influence some of uh, infection prevention activities at facility level um, and then you know maybe allocate some resource for high level advocacy how we can we can really use uh, the data that we collected to influence decision making at higher level um, overall i think it's the right direction thank you so because we have taken like uh, two gentlemen and one lady from this side so let me just take one one favor for a lady on the other side. So just Madam here, and this will be the last, and then we'll, we'll get the reactions from the presenters, and then we'll see. Madam, welcome. Thank you. Um, thank you for the presentations, and um, looking at the MAP2 proposal, as there is the plan to increase uh, volume, quality relevance, um, and representative of the lab data, uh, what are the interventions towards biosafety and security that are we thinking of? Because it is key as we develop these organisms, we repository them. What, what are we putting in quads in terms of capacity building on biosafety and security? Let's think how does biosafety and security come in as we increase the volume? Thank you. All right. So I, I hope I will remember <laughs> most most of your question. But I think start, starting with the the, the I think across uh, across all the all the intervention, uh, let's remember that MAP is not uh, operating in isolation. So there are other, uh, as I was saying. There are other grants, regional grants that are led by SLM. I think EQ Africa will take most of the capacity building, including the biosafety, including making sure that the lab clinical interface is reinforced. For example, I think the course will take the training aspect of it and really uh, um, uh, support the workforce. As you have seen on the slide, we will really try our best to include uh, the, Fleming, uh, the Fleming Fellows and the other grant. And, 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 and you will see that also in the group work, we will come back to you and say, okay, how can we best, um, uh, you know, divide and conquer and what should be some critical activity that the country grant should really take so that we, uh, we, um, we address uh, all those issues uh, better. So that's, that, that's one. Now, from the, the, the colleague that made a comment about the, the, the One Health, I think the other sectors, there's also a question on how can we now that you know, uh, uh, scale it up to animal health and environment. I think there is a lot less data probably uh, uh, be because there's, there's less surveillance in that sector. So how can we take that on board in the phase two will be, will be so, some of the things that we, we will be addressing. Uh, was there another from, from, from Dr. Ian? I can't, I, yeah, I think that's, that's uh, that, okay. <laughs> Yes, I think I agree. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, very interesting uh, comments, colleagues, uh, and we're very uh, grateful. I think just to also um, sort of bring a broader perspective uh, from the Africa CDC part is that, uh, yes, indeed, there's so much work to do. Uh, you've really named a lot of things that are not uh, currently reflected in the Fleming Fund uh, regional grant. But this is where we come in as Africa CDC. Uh, for example, the One Health part that you have mentioned, one of the things that the Africa Union is thinking about is how do we support other sectors through this model because the MAP model works. Um, I'm talking about issues of treatment guidelines, for example. I think one of the things that we are trying to do with uh, uh, Evelyn's team, EXA, is really to review uh, some of the uh, EXA has done like a regional uh, uh, treatment guideline, pulling the data from the three countries represented uh, under the EXA uh, region and, and using that data to inform and revise those treatment guidelines. So, uh, as well as infection prevention and control. I know that our team was in Cameroon uh, to support and try to help them establish what uh, their AJI surveillance should look like in line with the um, holistic um, IPC work that they are doing. And similarly with Dr. Tucci. So I think, yes, indeed, the Fleming Fund regional grant will address some of the issues. But like we said yesterday, or like Anofi said yesterday, it's like AMR is such a huge problem that 
one approach, one angle is not going to fix all. And this is why we come in as the African Union to say, uh, when other funders come, we are able to advocate for you to say, this model already works. How about you expand or support the initiatives that are already being done in, con in this country based off the work that you're doing? So I think that's how this all ties into uh, the broader work that you're doing. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. So maybe one last thing that is also important to take into consideration is like when MAP was, con was conducted, that was when I think most of the countries has not, had not yet fully implemented their national action plan. So I understand that many would have changed. For example, in Tanzania, we started our first national action plan in 2017. So when MAP came, it was just in the second year and we were just, you know, consolidating surveillance data. So we are hoping if something comes somewhere next, I think we'll have probably more and more of that. But the other thing, I think we need to take this uh, data positively. When we are, let's say, reviewing our data, these are the data which can now feed in our situation analysis. You know, when we are doing our first NAP in our respective countries, we are using, for example, just patchy research data to write our situation analysis, the SWOT analysis. But now we have like map data and many other data from the, our respective AMR surveillance from different settings in the across countries. So probably we should now use this data from map and from our respective surveillance data so that we can inform our situation analysis in our next review of our respective national action plan. I just wanted to highlight that. And then after saying that, let me now welcome Edwin. Thank you very much. Good morning, uh, colleagues. If I can have the slide uh, media team. So what we are going to do is we are going to break into groups where we will tackle a couple of questions that are going to guide us uh, following the discussion that we had earlier in terms of what MAP2 would look like. So we really want to get some thoughts uh, from you as member states how best we can then implement uh, that uh, MAP uh, phase two. So uh, we are going to be in the groups as per our regions. We are going to have the Southern Africa, which is Zimbabwe, Malawi, Eswatini, and Zambia. So you are going to be in group one. And then we are going to have the East Africa, which is Tanzania, Uganda, Kenya, also in another group. Then the Anglophone West Africa, you are also going to be in another group, Ghana, Sierra Leone, um, Nigeria, Ghana. And then our Francophone colleagues, Senegal, uh, Gabon, Cameroon, they're going to be uh, in another group. So we have uh, the breakout rooms. So group one, which is, oh, perfect. So these are the questions that we are going to look at to say how do we improve the overall coordination of these regional grants. And for this discussion, we are going to focus mainly on the map. So we want to make sure that our colleagues, the partners who are here, the country grantees, you join the groups as we will share in the next slide. So if you are supporting countries in Southern Africa, you then join that group. If you are supporting countries in East Africa, you then join those groups because we want to have uh, that one country approach as indicated by our colleagues from Mott McDonald yesterday. So that's the first question, focusing mainly on the coordination of our regional grants. The second question looks around, do we need now to move beyond the lab uh, passive surveillance? How do you think we can include animal health, environmental health in the MAP processes? I think this is a question that came from most of you, even yesterday after the reports, where you say this was done only on the human health. How do we then also incorporate your animal health, your environmental, so that they can also have this kind of baseline, et cetera, and collect data, leveraging on some of the tools and systems that we have already developed uh, under MAP phase one. There is no need for us to reinvent the wheel. WhoNet can be used in animal health. It's used in animal health as well. Then the third question looks around the recommendations to ensure that we maintain that full country ownership of the data. 
I think in map phase one, we tried as much as we could to ensure that the country retains ownership of the data. Where the data is sitting right now uh, on our map store under the custody of Africa CDC, only the countries have access. And most of you, I'm sure you receive the credentials, you've started utilizing that system. So we want to get more recommendations in terms of how do we then maintain that full ownership. Uh, ensuring that we continue to share the data. I think the sharing of the data at a regional and global level is very key. So we are thinking around how do we make sure that that repository enables us to share uh, the data uh, globally and regionally. And then lastly, the fourth question looks at uh, the recommendations that you have in terms of engaging the private sector in terms of the data collection. I think we saw from the presentations a number of laboratories, pharmacies, that contributed data to the map. We also saw from some of the presentations from Quas where we only had two private uh, institutions participating. So we want then to expand that to uh, cover more private sector players, which is in line also with what we got from the Mott McDonald yesterday. So those are the four key questions that we want uh, the teams to be discussing in the groups. And then uh, you will have a rapporteur and you will have facilitators that you have assigned who will join you in those groups. And um, after tea, you will then have a report back that we will have. So in terms of uh, the groups, just to recap them, group one, which is uh, Gabon, Cameroon, and Senegal, uh, you will have your facilitators. Pascal is going to join that group, uh, Margaret, as well as uh, Valentine. Uh, and you are going to be in Baringo. Uh, room, which is the glass room. When you go past the elevator, you'll see a glass um, room there. That's where you're going to be. Group two, uh, which is Zimbabwe, Malawi, Zambia, and Eswatini. I'm going to join that group together with Dr. Aitenyo uh, and Sylvester. So we are going to be in uh, Nakuru room, which is just outside um, near the banner that we have put for the meeting. Group three, which is Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, and Ethiopia. Uh, you are going to be in Naivasha room, which is the next room to uh, Nakuru. And you will have Collins, Anafi, Junior, and Witness joining you uh, in that group. Then group four, you are going to remain in this room. And I think that's why one day is sitting in front. <laughs> So that's one day's group. So you are going to remain here. That's Ghana, Nigeria, Sierra Leone, and Bangladesh. So Beatrice is also going to join that group as well as uh, Eli. So I think this is quite clear in terms of what we need to do. So we are going to quickly jump into these group discussions. And um, after tea, we will then do a report back. Any comments, questions that you may have? Yes, Pascal. Yeah, so for the report back, we, we will not put them on slides. So we'll have the rapporteur just, just read uh, the, you know, the, the, the outcome of the discussion. Eh? Let's make it easy for us. Per question, that would be good. Because we are running by in time. Yeah? So we do 30 minutes. So we do 30 minutes? Yeah. So that means up to 10.50. So members, welcome back. Uh, hope you had a great uh, breakfast. Uh, let's now take, take our seats so that we, we start. So we're going to have a feedback and general discussion on the group work that we had. So we have a total of four groups. And will be the feedback from the respective groups will be presented by either a chairperson of a group or the rapporteur, depending on uh, how the group has arranged. So we'll be welcoming the chairperson and the rapporteur. Eight of them can come here. Then he or she will present what they've discussed in their respective group. 
And then I think we'll probably go across all the four groups, and then towards the end we can have now a round table discussion. Uh, because some of the thematic areas will be maybe similar across the groups. Like if we take one group and then we start the discussion, we may be maybe preempting the subsequent group. So we'll take them in a row, and when we finish, then we'll have a round table discussion. We discuss all, we discuss the deliberations from the four groups see, together. So now without wasting time, let me now welcome the either chairperson or repertoire from group one. Group one. So this was representing Gabon, Cameroon, and Senegal. So uh, either chairperson or a repertoire from this group, kindly take the stage so that you proceed. Yeah, what, what I was saying, I'm, I'm hoping you haven't prepared a PowerPoint. So you'll just come here with your, you know, the deliberation. Either if, if it's written on a paper, that's fine. Just come here and then present the deliberation from your respective group. And then we'll call the second group, then the third group, and we'll have a discussion at the end. So welcome, madam. Good morning all. Concerning group one made up by Cameroon, Gabon and Senegal, we went through the four questions and the first one, the methodology was to ask the status in each country and then compile the recommendation for both for all the countries. So how do we improve the coordination at the regional ground with actors on the ground? So the first thing was that in each, in those countries, there was not a formal coordination structure apart from Senegal, where the coordination is under the leadership of the general secretary of the prime minister. So as recommendation, we suggest first to put in place this coordination committee, which can, which will be multi-sectorial, and also to place the leadership at a higher level up to the other sector, like done in Senegal, maybe at the premature level. And also, concerning country ground, Cameroon and Gabon are not beneficiary of it, so it was also suggested to address a request to Africa CDC to support the application of Cameroon and Gabon for country ground grants. Concerning the second question, about uh, the need to extend what is already done in terms of passive surveillance to animal and environmental sectors. It came out that for all the country, the surveillance is developed mainly for human health. And it, there is a need to extend it to animal sectors and environmental sector. And the recommendation is that for animal and environmental sector, we need to conduct point prevalence survey to do active surveillance because it can be difficult at it and now to continue with routines, to establish routine surveillance maybe in animal and especially for environmental sector which is not yet well developed. And also for, also for human health, it was suggested to strengthen what is already done concerning surveillance and also other active surveillance. The third question was recommendation to maintain the full ownership of data. And the first thing was that till now some countries doesn't have access uh, credential to reach their data. So some recommendation was now make sure first they have access to have those data has, and for all the stakeholders who sign the memorandum of data sharing, they have to respect the Nagoya protocol 
in terms of utilization and sharing of data, and also concerning some aspect of publication, scientific publication, all the stakeholders should be associated on that. The, uh, another recommendation is to adhere to the convention that was signed by the ministry and also add the economic communities to support what is, on, uh, is already done in terms of uh, antimicrobial resistance like WAO or SEAC. They are not well implicated in the activities for some countries like Cameroon and Gabon. The last question on how to engage the private sector. Some laboratories, private laboratories are already engaged regarding Cameroon, but it was not the case for all the countries and the recommendation is really first to put in, in place a a coordination structure, like mentioned in the first question, develop SOP for surveillance and then extend it to private structure. And also the need to put in common some protocol that can be shared with other countries to improve uh, trans surveillance transfrontalier. I think this is what was done regarding group one. If you have any question, the colleagues of the group are able to answer. Thank you. So thank you very much, Madam. Uh, I think you have represented it very well, Gabon, Cameroon, and Senegal. So may I now welcome the representative from group two. This will be representing Zimbabwe, Malawi, Zambia, and the Eswatini. Please, the chairperson or a secretary or a rapporteur, whoever is prepared by the group, you can kindly take up the stage. Okay, <laughs> that's great. So as we, wait, as we wait then, we can go to group three. So group three, we have Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, Ethiopia. Uh, so, this is, uh, so these are four countries. So again, the uh, repertoire or, or chairperson, you can take up the stage and then we'll go back to those in group two, please don't worry. We'll always come back to you. So make sure that you arrange and organize among yourself so that you are ready to present your deliberations. So welcome, Doc. Thank you so much. Uh, this is group three. That is Kenya, Tanzania, Ethiopia, and Uganda. Um, so for question one, how can, oh, my name is Namowiro Sauda Chezeto. I'm a clinical microbiologist. Overall, how can we improve coordination of the regional grant with actors on the ground. One is engage the governments to take up ownership of AMR interventions through a One Health approach as a primary role rather than, a, a, rather than an additional role to ensure sustainability. Then uh, complementarity between the different Fleming Fund grants, that is country grant and regional grant. Leverage on capacity developed from uh, phase one empower existing structures both at national and sub-national levels to execute their functions as a primary function rather than an additional role and then uh, we have a new uh, we have ethiopia and it was not in map one so involve ethiopia so that we can learn from their wealth of knowledge in implementing mr activities is there a need to go beyond the lab-based passive surveillance and how do we include the animal sector so here, a very important aspect came out, and this is uh, strengthening diagnostic stewardship and enhancing clinician laboratory interface to ensure quality of the data. If we have the pre-analytical phases well uh, streamlined and uh, empowered, then we can have quality analytical and then post-analytical, and then we shall have quality data. Then strengthen advocacy to other sectors beyond human health, that is animal envi environment and aquaculture, to ensure their full participation and balance across sectors in all activities. 
then community engagement and drafting a community strategy to uh, ensure that AMR is understood outside the technical uh, areas or competences. The MR, then uh, to have AMR surveys, which include animal, environment, and water. Sometimes what we have as national level data is not enough to inform uh, policies and planning. What are the recommendations to uh, maintain full country ownership? Seek ethical approval before any data collection endeavors and publishing. Uh, emphasis on transparency from the start. Functionalize the existing platforms for regional coordination, uh, things like ECOS, uh, communities of practice at the regional level and continent level. Data sharing should be through the existing platforms, and we have pl platforms like ECHO. Uh, data sharing will be defined, and this is having uh, data sharing, binding data sharing agreements to maintain country ownership. And then most importantly, uh, data should be reported using the existing national platforms so that the national level has the data and is utilizing it as well as the uh, program or the regional uh, map. What are the recommendations to engage the uh, private sector in data collection? Uh, first of all, it is compulsory, it is mandatory, it is a responsibility of the private practitioners to share data like for other health programs. Uh, so build experience from similar projects like HIV, TB and malaria that have successfully en uh, engaged the private sectors. Uh, include AMR, include private sector on AMR advisory committees or national coordination committees. Capacity building and incentivizing the private sector to ensure quality data is generated. And then use their existing umbrella bodies and uh, uh, agreements like the, in Uganda we have the public uh, private uh, partnership. Yes. Thank you. That is from that team. A group member can feel free to remind me if I've forgotten anything. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Doc. I think that has been extensive and exhaustive. We'll have time at the end of the presentation so that we can uh, even air out things maybe which have been forgotten in our respective uh, groups. So let me now welcome a representative from Group 2. This is representing Zimbabwe, Malawi, Zambia, and the ESWAT team. So, Mr. Zimbwe, the floor is yours. Thank you. So, from Group 2, and uh, uh, these are the contribution on question number one, on the overall how we can improve coordination of regional grant. So from group two, the first of all, our group two emphasized on coordination improvement of all grant by MRCC. Need of country grant ownership that will avoid duplication of one health activities by involved the key players on one health approach. All key players and the sector should be known and involved in the primary stages to facilitate a grant in the regional and look on how could implement the in country which will be overseas by MRCC. Also, regional grant need to involve beneficiary countries in, during the implement during the coordination or implementation and the setup of the projects to set priorities activities to, to, to conduct and create ownership of MRCC and the conduct at large. All coordination and implementation for grant by technical working groups should be done by MRCC. And all coordination and, uh, and MRCC, training of MRCC in coordination and implementation of a grant should be kept in implemented in a follow-up to be done. MRCC should be part of the meetings on original grant and the country grant, which will foster ownership, governance, and the better outcomes. Upon implementation and, and the coordination of a grant in countries, MRCC should conduct the quarter meeting to assess the implementation and the work plan coordination. So, and question number two is about the, is there any need to improve beyond the lab uh, based uh, passive surveillance? Yes, but sh the, the following should be uh, taken in place. Could be done by the following needs to be addressed. First of all, the, there is a need to, uh, to or fund 
which will foster surveillance for primary health sectors. Most have been done in tertiary hospitals. So first of all, we have to improve in primary health before uh, expanding the project. Add a number of a sentinel site to collect more data, quality uh, data and uh, data for current have a few coverage of sentinel site. Improve data quality and step in stepwise, but a lot have been done in human health, but in animal health, few have been done. So that we, we also, before imp improving or expanding the, the programs, we have to foster also the improvement in animal health collection of data. In about the data sharing, uh, yes, it's a good thing to, to make the data sharing between a regional or within the country, within the different sector within a country. But the agreement should be signed between during the, the, during the regional or country grant uh, implementations or, or setting. So, so that to foster, to make easiest way of transfer of data. Involve regulatory authorities because some data have been, uh, have the challenge somehow to, to, to share even within the country and sometimes outside the country. So the regulatory authority should be, uh, should, should be involved in the primary uh, stages in data sharing or in, in the signing of a grantee uh, agreement. Needed, uh, needed engagement of govern, government and other stakeholders during the signing of contracting that will involve the data sharing. Ensure mutual understanding between sectors. Uh, one health will facilitate data sharing, community practice, and the lens from each other in regional, in regional wise and the countries. Address all institutional and the countries boundaries and how policies and on data sharing could be done. Address also improvement of countries and the regional surveillance transparency on data sharing. And the last question about the private sector on data collections involvement. Yes, this is very important, especially in a one health approach. But the following should be done also to make it easier in sharing of data between, from the private sector or to involve the private sector in, in, in grant. Yes, involve the private sector on training, meeting and, and the meeting feedback, especially for antimicrobial resistance in both the animal and the, and the human health. Uh, also to, to write the MOU, Memorandum of Understand, for collaboration between the public and the private sectors. So ensure the better public private sector partnership on one health approach on sharing of data and uh, use to use the H HIV malaria programs and other vertical programs as lesson learned on how they have been successful on sharing of data regardless of the private or government institutions. And the last one is to ensure the capacity building. What we invested a lot in capacity building in the public sectors, only government institutions should be done at the same way in the private sector also. Thank you. So thank, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Zimbwe. I think that was also very insightful. And you can see some of the themes, uh, these emerging themes are actually going across the across the groups. And that's why we said it's important that we don't preempt the subsequent group. We'll actually do the discussion at the end. So let me now welcome the representative uh, from group four. This is representing Ghana, Nigeria, Sierra Leone, and Bangladesh. So, so please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm representing um, group four, um, given the Conclusions out of good for, and I'm also Ghanaian, so. <laughs> so for group four, when it came to talking about coordination, there was consensus, and I think that has been raised by the other groups, that it has to be coordinated through the AMRCC. The, the key um, thing that we discussed in the group is the need to capacitate the AMRCC to do this better. Um, the, the, uh, Dr. Tochi brought the experience of Nigeria to say that there is a lot of capacitation and strengthening that the AMRCCs themselves need to be able to take ownership of the process and to be able to monitor what is being done from the grants. And then also there was the issue of governance within the AMRCCs to ensure that all sectors and all governance structures are representative so that when the AMRCC makes a decision, that decision is binding at a national level. On the second question of um, the passive surveillance being primarily from the human lab, 
um, what was discussed in the group was the capacities of the other sectors to be able to do surveillance and to produce quality data. So there was a need, the need identified there was number one for us to focus intentionally with targets on building the capacity of the animal health, environmental health and food safety sectors. And we know that that may be a, a medium to long term because it's a process that is ongoing. So in the interim, there is also a need to identify existing capacity. So we had um, examples where um, the, the government is collaborating with pro, um, universities and private sector health facilities who we know sometimes have better infrastructure than us to, in the interim to be able to conduct this, these surveillance activities. But the need to be very intentional about um, capacitating those sectors so that they can start producing quality data that can be used for surveillance was highlighted. On the question of um, data sharing, there were three things that were discussed. Number one is the policy and regulation at the national level that we must lead to the process of saying what do we do and how are we going to do it. And be clear, um, Dr. Toji said that it's not the tail doesn't work, the dog is the dog that works the tail. And so when we go into these conversations, we must know what we're doing first. And so that when we're having the conversation, we're clear with every partner that there is policies, and regulations in place about how um, how data sharing is going to be performed at the national level. The regional level or continental level data sharing agreements were also discussed that those need to be formalized through the AU. The other aspect coming back to the country was in our ability ourselves to be able to have to generate and store that data appropriately and to ensure that we build our systems to ensure that we can store and manage that data. Uh, but there was a consensus that there is a need for all of us to share because all the data we generated is needed to be able to combat this at a global level. But how we do that, we need to be very clear about. So th those were the conclusions from Group 4. Thank you. So thank you very much uh, for the contribution and deliberation from Group 4. Now members, let's, let me now welcome you so that we can now have a round table discussion. Uh, if there's anything which was forgotten in your respective group, but also if you want maybe to add more information, you want to contribute more, maybe you want to take us into another direction, maybe which was totally not mentioned in your respective group, maybe due to time constraints. So I think now the floor is open. Uh, I think we can use the usual mechanism. You just raise up your hand and then you'll be picking, uh, taking into account uh, the gender, country representation, and also we'll take all the parameters into consideration. Yes, please. In our group, group uh, Maybe, <coughs> sorry, before you start, I think the rapporteur again, please, can you keep on taking the notes. So you can check what you have, and if something is really new, it's not captured before, you can always add it to your respective list. And then at the end of the day, you will convert those from the paper into electronic version. So like, maybe you can type them well, organize them well, and then submit them to the secretariat. So yes, thank please. you very much. I said in our group, group one, uh, the first question in, in Cameroon, uh, the uh, MRS surveillance is done both by the veterinary and the human sector, he, he wasn't captured in the report she gave. She said uh, most of the, the countries, the, is, uh, the veterinary sector or the animal sector is not, they don't do it. But maybe bad for Cameroon, she should act bad for Cameroon, except Cameroon if you want. Thank you. Okay, that's, uh, I think that's just a compliment, it's an addition, so thank you. So please, the rapporteur who was in the Cameroon group, please take that, take note of that. Any other? This is now a discussion, so you can actually, you can actually articulate more. You can actually expand more from what they have, and especially we want also to get a really the live experience, live experience. What is really happening on the ground from our respective country? Because if we have that live experience from the ground, that will make like the map to practically 
like in terms of operation, it will be practical because it will be like harnessing what we have from the ground. So please, welcome. Okay, just uh, a comment on um, uh, extending the survey beyond the laboratory. Uh, I'm John from Zambia, by the way. That's great. Yeah, our experience on uh, identifying drivers for risk uh, for MR. What we observed that we, we did a survey in humans, both at lab and community. And it was very difficult to identify particular drivers. And so what we came to a conclusion that most of these drivers are operating at community level, not at individual level. Yeah, so such that if you are doing risk factor, trying to use individual persons, it may be difficult to identify them. But if you look at community level, then you may find drivers. Because you find that resistant isolates are also fine in people who are not sick. And just in community, they find resistant pathogens. Thank you. That's great. So we, if we want to really delineate the MRI driver, so he's emphasizing that, should also look it at the end of the community. So maybe the focus group discussion, maybe the in-depth interview, apart from like one-on-one, -on -one, like a patient and then the researcher. Angle. So that's a, that's a very good and the problem, that's an area where maybe we're not doing well. The part of the social anthropology when it comes to AMR. We do a lot of, you know, huge data, then we translate them quantitatively because we are clinicians, we are scientists, and then we leave the social anthropology part which will then translate this data qualitatively and which will like, go down to the community like what John is saying here. So thank you very much for bringing that. And we need also, maybe the Fleming Fellow can think of bringing those people with that expertise. Because I think we are, we are lacking the social anthropology who will also help us to, you know, to translate this data from quantity to qualitative. So thank you. So please welcome, Doc, and then. Okay, thank you. Uh, once again, my name is Sati from Nigeria. So just to add to the uh, surveillance in the animal health sector. You know, um, <clears throat> unlike the human health sector, where this surveillance is, you know, uh, best uh, at the hospital levels, uh, for the animal health sector, you know, because we are dealing with animals, and uh, what is best or to generate enough data will be to carry out active surveillance especially at the farm level and at the abattoirs. So these are points where, you know, this active surveillance can, can be carried out. And then when we do that, we'll be able to generate a lot of data uh, for the animal health sector. But that is also not to uh, lose sight of the uh, clinics, you know, the veterinary clinics where, you know, animals uh, come in for treatment. Uh, especially the teaching hospitals in the universities, so those are some points also. But uh, it's very key because, you know, one of the other aspects of antimicrobial, apart from the antimicrobial resistance, is also drug residues. And, you know, they go hand in hand, especially for farmers, especially poultry farmers, you know, a lot, there's a lot of antimicrobial use by farmers. And I think we need to generate date, that data so that sure. it will inform you know, policy on how to contain this AMR at the farm levels. So it's very critical that we deliberately, you know, uh, uh, look at that uh, aspect. Thank you. That's great. So unlike the hospital, so we have very few veterinary clinics in our state, especially in low and middle income countries. Uh, so I think what is really emphasizing, we need to move now, not from passive surveillance like what we do in human sector, we need to do the active surveillance in the veterinary sector. And he's emphasizing should be at the farm level because we really want to have this trend analysis. So you do the same farm, you go after maybe six, hour, six months in the same farm again so that at the end of the day you can even have something to advise them. I think let's capture that clearly. Uh, thank you. Uh -huh. So we go here from Kenya and then down there South Africa, from South Africa. And then we'll go. We'll continue. We still have time. So uh, two more, and then we go this. Thank you. I emphasize on the aspect of um, uh, during communication, uh, the reason why sometimes um, our voices may not be heard 
is uh, the putting of the data, the output that we have in a language that will make sense to government. And that is why I feel that as we continue doing this, uh, the attributable deaths and disability and just and live years that are caused by some of these infections and uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria in the region should be made clear. Uh, so that will help us capture uh, data for policy purposes. When it comes to the animal side, uh, what are the economic losses uh, that we can attribute uh, to these uh, kind of infections and um, uh, that are impacting on the, whether it's the farmer or whoever uh, the person who is uh, uh, relating with those animals. Uh, looking at the environment, uh, our water pollution uh, effluents running down to rivers that are being used downstream. So uh, putting that and bringing in the aspect of uh, health economics, uh, so that health economists uh, now plus the physicians, the environmentalists, and the animal, uh, the, the vets, uh, 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 working closely with the health economics, uh, economists would be able to interpret uh, the, this economic data uh, to government. So I think at the end of the day, we need to think broadly about that. That's great. Thank you very much. I think maybe we can also discuss that even tomorrow, that let's remember that we have done a lot when it comes to fellows, microbiology, laboratory, policy, pharmacy. We haven't done on, for example, the AMR related to health. So we need also the health economists who will be talking of AMR at the, you know, the finance angle, at the economy angle, and the police as well. So I think uh, that's very good. And I thank you also for even emphasizing on what the colleague here uh, said. Uh, then South Africa. Yes, Doc Curry. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, South Africa is not a Fleming Fund country re uh, receiver, so I'm not talking on, in that uh, perspective. I just want to um, give you some my our opinion, what we have from our surveillance, um, uh, and which way I can give us uh, some studies uh, outcome. So, firstly, uh, regarding community um, uh, surveillance. Uh, uh, it seems that the best case scenario is to go with the pilot studies with the specific objectives in what direction to go. Example we had with a big study we done in South Africa in one well controlled uh, farm where we found no transmission in between the uh, pigs and the uh, farm worker at that um, in, in that farm. So meaning that uh, if you have an IPC well uh, implemented, there is a, a breakage of transmission. On another uh, study that uh, I was a reviewer, they had the opposite uh, uh, finding from small holding farms where, this, where the transmission is, where no IPC is implemented. So it's very important when you talk about um, the different one route approach to get the specific objectives and specific uh, question what to uh, look at uh, from community. The same apply uh, for the certain area. For example, we've done also in a, one of the African country pregnant women's uh, colonization. And we find also different uh, compared to what is uh, published. So it's a, it, it is uh, important that each country uh, get a pilot in a, in a way. So that's uh, uh, just to give a, a, that's feedback, at least from our perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a huge experience from South Africa. So the main point there is much as we can have like uh, common platforms across countries, but again, let's emphasize on the local context. So much as we'll have something unifying us together, be it SOP, be it policy, be it guideline, but then we need to go a little, another step ahead. We make sure that that is contextualized into our local, into our local context. So thank you very much for that. Please, take a step. Hello, yeah, this is Ghana. Yeah. Um, I want to emphasize on, uh, give further contribution on uh, the fourth question. What are your recommendations to engage the private sector in the collection of, or in data collection? Uh, as we all know, the pr private sector formed the chunk of our uh, laboratories in maybe all the countries, all the various countries. If not for Ghana, 
we have a lot of private sectors who are doing microbiology and do culture and susceptibility, antimicrobial. So we actually need to involve them. Uh, one thing uh, is the private sector, they seem to be autonomous doing their own, own things at their sector, but with the funding and all, other sustainability uh, measures, we can continuously involve them. We make sure that they are doing the right thing. The other thing is they do a lot of uh, the microbiological investigations, but are they doing it rightly as compared to the public sector? And uh, we are talking about quality management systems and other uh, things. Do they go by th those? So when we involve them, we'll be able to let them move with us. Let them go by the regulations, go by the standards of investigations. And uh, make sure also that uh, we get the data from them. Uh, whatever logistics we have as a project, we should try to uh, let them have some. And that will also encourage them to always give us the data that uh, we want. Um, I also have here that they should be educated a lot in doing and keeping uh, and releasing of uh, documents. Uh, I think so. The private sector is very crucial that we involve them. And for sustainability, we should even try to integrate it into our systems. Uh, the various uh, countries have their data systems, uh, be it at the ministry level, uh, for Ghana, we have it at the ministry level and we have it at the Ghana Health Service level. We have the DIMS too. This will have management information systems and which all the facilities, be it Ghana Health Service or not. You know what happens is when our president is called upon or our minister of health is called upon to give a data, they come to Ghana Health Service because we implement, we are the major implementers of the policies of the ministry. Uh, so when they come to Ghana Health Service and we only give information on Ghana Health Service facilities, the regional uh, laboratories, the district laboratories, then it's not holistic. It doesn't show a, a country data. So Ghana Health Service for that matter also try to involve, I work with the, the teaching hospitals, I work with the child, faith-based, Amadia child, Christian Health Association of Ghana, and I work with the other institutions, uh, but those I don't work with mostly are the APML. We have uh, APML, which is Association of Private Medical Labs. They are like standalone labs. Uh, the reason why it, um, I find it difficult working with them is that most of the data also, we need interventions at the clinic level, uh, but they are only standalone labs and they don't have clinics. But then we try to involve them in some of our, our things. So that's what I can say. So that for sustainability, for integration, we should try to bring them in. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's great. So he's emphasizing on how best we can engage the private sectors. And actually he's building from a representative from Group 3. A representative from Group 3 highlighted that we can engage the private sector through the regulatory authority, their regulatory authority. And now he's bringing another very good thing that like we can actually look, for example, those who have already laboratory diagnostic infrastructure, then we leverage on that. And then he said we need to train them, ensuring that whatever they are generating, are actually conforming, conforming to the standard. And he emphasized another very good thing. We need to share the resources. We need to share the resources with them. Much as we are pulling these resources to public, let's see how best we can also share even a little to the private sector. And then through that, we can bring them also in the loop. Thank you very, very much on that. Uh, so, so back to, uh, yeah. So a colleague from Tanzania there. And then. Uh, Thank you very much. And. Uh, <coughs> A little bit, uh, I want to contribute on uh, animal, uh, 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 animal sector. Uh, if we want to increase, for my experience, if we want to increase the correction of um, amount of data, I think we have to <clears throat> uh, connect it to financial aspect. It's like somebody, someone contributed. Also, we had on, uh, uh, there are those financial institutions which are dealing with insurance for animal. Is, uh, especially on the animal with uh, producing milk. Uh, in Tanzania, let, let, let's say, some of these financial institutions are coming on, on uh, uh, health insurance on, uh, on, on, on animal. And uh, one of the aspect, uh, aspect is that uh, they, they are asking which one, what, the, uh, uh, what uh, risk 
which we are, they are going to get it uh, on, on, on ensuring the animal animal health. Uh, the the risk uh, the big risk on them is uh, antimicrobial resistance. So uh, we told them to uh, maybe <coughs> to correct it, this data from the the the, 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 the from uh, these uh, um, uh, animal keepers uh, monthly. Or, uh, and uh, and they check for antimicrobial resistance because whenever they found this uh, the uh, resistance organism, they are going to use a lot of uh, a lot of uh, fund on that one, and uh, they agreed. I think this also the uh, good aspect of collecting data or for surveillance in animal. Thank you. Thank you. So he's also emphasizing on uh, engaging also the private sector, but also collecting more information, more data from like the animal the animals and it's giving it's giving also some practical experience on the ground what they are doing in tanzania so yes please john welcome again for yes. the second time um on engaging the the private labs uh in animal health uh, we had a discussion with one of the it's a good lab and uh, they are doing a good job on microbiology now, what we found that the, the, the cost of processing a sample from uh, processing from the uh, culturing up to AST is about $20. Yeah, so now that, that brings in the question of affordability on part of the small scale guys. So we found that the ones that are paying for this service are those you know, bigger enterprises. But now, the problem for MR from our understanding is much of a problem in a small scale farmer and this is a person who can't afford to pay for the service. We try to negotiate if they could be supported in any way, the private labs, but now the question comes in what happens if that support is withdrawn? Are they going to revise their pricing structure and the other things? So there are a number of things that need to be discussed with the private labs. And so what we see at the moment is that the data that will come from the private labs will be skewed into the match uh, representing the small scale uh, enterprises. I see. So thanks for, thanks for that. I think those are, those are the critical things that we need to discuss. Much as Zambia are talking of you know, a challenge of how do we integrate the small scale farmers so that their data can also be part and parcel of the national level, level, national level that. So the issue of how what will be like the best financing mechanism if you get a grant what if that grant come to an end those are the things i think we should be taking into consideration much as we want to make sure that everyone is in the everyone is in the loop yes look from uganda there so please welcome Dr. thank you very much uh for the opportunity yeah i think what we are discussing now uh we are moving away from our individual way of interacting with patients in our clinical rooms or in our clinical set setups and then we are moving more of public health dealing with so many and the issue of private sector is very critical that government still has governments still have mandate on them by having mandate on them they are required to report we have seen this happening in sex, sex sections like HIV, TB, malaria, when they are reporting. And this contributes to the National Public Health Database in true to planning. Now, if microbiology is coming, I think we don't need to reinvent the wheel. This I mentioned it in our group. We just need to leverage on what has been done in place. So microbiology is AMR. AMR is microbiology. So how do we, do governments or partners who are working for government support these private labs? Let's incentivize them. You're not going to buy them reagents. You're not going to buy them uh, test kits because they are profit making, but train them, build capacity in them as you are setting your national programs, involve the private sector, go through their associations or umbrella bodies, and indeed they will be obliged also to report than us just going and asking data for them, yet we have not invested in, into it as government. They will keep their data. 
They will think you want to regulate them by tax, ta taxing them more. I am speaking out of experience. So, in my country, they will hold on to their information because they will think they want to see how much is a test. It is $20. So this lab is running 200 tests per day times the $20. This is how much you are making. So the revenue authority will come and levy taxes on you. So we don't want that. But we want to involve them. As we are setting our community of practice, they, uh, let's have private sector involved because I can assure you they also have gaps. They want to minimize costs so they may employ staff who are not all that best. So let us use that opportunity as government as we are having these partners, as we are setting our QA quality panels, run them, give them feedback. In doing that we are helping them and they will be obliged to share information with us. I submit. That's a very, very good point, Daktari. We really appreciate on that. So we can leverage actually what is existing on malaria, TB, and HIV AIDS. And use that platform to see how best we can then utilize it for the AMR surveillance. But it is raising a very important point that, you know, we shouldn't subject them to uncertainties. And they are very keen on that. If they know that like, we are maybe collecting data so that they can be maybe taxed more, then they'll run away of them. So one of the maybe the financing mechanism, we can actually start discussing at country level. How do we, for example, convince the, let's say, the health insurance which are existing? Is there a room of maybe waiving some of these costs? Like if maybe, you know, for example, with the HIV, TB, most of the diagnostic tests are waived. So in that way, we can also do that in AMR. So these are just food for thought, which we need to make sure that we, as we keep on deliberating, we are putting them in context. So, Madam, welcome. Thank you very much. There's actually something we are planning to do in Nigeria over the next um, one month or thereabout. We realized that we continue to talk about the private sector. We try to diagnose them and understand them but we have never called them to get their own perspective and their own point of view. So we are now trying to even understand what private sector means in our own context, in the different sectors. What is the picture of the private sector in human health, environment, and food and agriculture? So we are planning to convene a meeting of the private sector however we're able to get that done, just present the problem and have the solutions and their own understanding of the solutions come from them. And this is a lesson we have learned over time that we continue to arrogate to ourselves the fact that we understand and we get their perspective when we really do not. So we have now learned that we can prescribe for the private sector. We must sit with the private sector, understand the problem and then come up with the solutions by their own participation. So that's the way we are planning to go um, in Nigeria. Thank you. That's great. So she's really emphasizing on how we should bring them in our usual committee, all the way from MRCC down to the technical working group. So if I give an experience quickly from Tanzania, for the first time, last year when we were analyzing our previous national action plan, one of the critical gaps that we noted, we were not engaging the private sector. And in the new NAP, which we are going to start implementing this year, we have brought in, for example, the Aga Khan Hospital, which is one of the tertiary hospitals, which is doing very well in Tanzania. And when we engaged them in one of the high-level meetings, they were even surprised that, you guys, how have you been working on for the past five years without engaging us? And yet we have all the diagnostic infrastructure. They have been accredited as one of the antimicrobial stewardship center for excellence with like international body. So they say we have huge things on the ground. So they were very happy. So I think let's engage them. Once we engage them, they will, we can actually get more information and we can also, we, when we generate our data, they'll not be biased towards, towards like public entities, but it'll be actually holistic across our, uh, our countries. So I think we have discussed a lot and I'm happy that there's no more hand which is raised. <laughs> So let's now, the repertoire can now put all this into their respective reports and then you submit to the secretariat and then they will be now compiled into like a major consultative deliberation as far as MAP2, as far as MAP2 is concerned. Uh, 
let me just uh, get some hints from my co-chair. Well, so thank you members for your active engagement in this morning session. We are coming to an end of the our, our first part session. So we'll now go for lunch and it will be, we are expect, we are we're going to be back at exactly 1.30, 1.30. So I think we'll have enough time. And then from there, I'll be handing over the chairmanship to my colleague, Dr. Ignatius Iwinibuno, who will be now taking the next part. I'll also be around here making sure that we cross fertilize one another in the next part of the session. So thank you very much and enjoy your lunch. Certain sites across the 14 countries that have been selected. 10 labs supported to accreditation onto ISO 5189 In fact, Africa CDC has endorsed the framework that is being used to support this EQA program. Training current developed. However, some gaps are still available in spite of these wonderful achievements. Roughly half of all participating labs achieve an overall score of over 80%. So there's still a gap that must be filled. The need for us to support the operation, the expansion, and the sustainability of AMR EQA programs and bacteriology testing. With us to present on the topic is a team that is led by Beatrice Van der Poy and the team members Fatima Paolo and Melissa Mick. They were presenting on the topic from a regional EQA program to quality assured bacteriology testing for all. What should EQA Africa 2 look like? Shall we, with the honor, welcome our presenter for this afternoon, Beatrice, Madam Beatrice Van der Poy. Oh, I thought we were not happy to receive her. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. And um, as Ignatius says, yes, we do have something called .com. So to avoid that, I will persevere to keep my presentation short and sweet. And hopefully, when we go into our groups, have discussions that can enable us to sustain through the afternoon. So today, just in the interest of time, it's just going to be me. Unfortunately, my colleague Melissa could not travel in. So you're just going to have to have me for the afternoon. So the presentation is the regional external QQA Africa. What does phase two look like? In phase, for phase two of EQA Africa, um, we're really looking first and foremost at expanding on the gains that we've already made from phase one. So one of those has to be the EQA program, the regional EQA program for AMR. We have been able to successfully implement four cycles. And so we would like to see this program expand within the current countries that we are. We know there are more labs um, who have the criteria for enrollment who either were not recommended by the country, because every lab that is participating was recommended by either the Ministry of Health or by the AMRCC. 
So um, if a lab is in our program, that was where, that was how they were enrolled onto the program. And also as we were building capacity, we had a certain number of labs that at that time we could absorb. And so we know that there is demand still from the countries for us to um, absorb more labs. And so we want to be able to do that. To do that means we also need to continue to look at the capacity of the EQA providers to be able to absorb that expanded program. And also, as we've discussed during this session, is to look at the design of the panels moving forward. The panels that we produce cut across all sectors. However, as has been discussed over the yesterday and part of today, there may be specific needs and priorities per sector where we want to check to make sure that the lab, the data they're producing is in line with those pathogens, those priority pathogens. And so there is a, also a need to look at specific panels where necessary to cover those different sectors. Obviously with that is our added, the value um, that we have in our program for supporting improvement. And so we want to expand further continue with our, our um, a community of practice, but also looking at adding more value to that in terms of knowledge sharing, so building a knowledge hub. Um, and, and this community of practice also incorporates MAP and QAS. And then also looking at the other e, um, regional, international um, AMR corps, how can we collaborate with them so that we can bring more learning and more capacity building to laboratory professionals in our sector? Obviously, we want to continue building and expanding the informatics system. And you know, the vision for the informatics system is that once it's established, it is something that would be available as well to countries where they are looking to establish their programs. And so we are very keen to see how we move forward and to, um, to finalize. So that is a, the bacteriology model is very well advanced, very, very advanced. At the moment, it can run 90% of all programs, but we want to make sure that we can also add capacity for other disciplines as well. The training and qualification framework, which we finalized in phase one, we're piloting at the moment and we want to be able to expand that further. So when you're talking about training for EQA, there isn't a specific curriculum, right, that you need to, there are bits that, from different places that you need to put together and combine into a framework. So for example, you need to know QMS, yes, that's one aspect, but you also need to know about IATA regulations. Depending on what discipline you want to provide a program for, you need to know requirements for that discipline in terms of sample preparation, etc. So we also want to make sure that we can roll out this, put together those components into a curriculum package that we can support countries to train their, their personnel with or to provide training to the countries um, to have that capacity building. And then obviously provide also the qualification exam. Quality management systems keeps coming back because, you know, we, we have spent the last day and a half talking about data. You know, the, the results from MAP have been fantastic. And all of that is based on data. All the general data we use for AMR surveillance and to inform AMR use, etc., comes from data. And the majority of that data is generated from labs. Our, whether it's an animal health lab, a human health lab, a, 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 a food safety and environment, the, the discussions when we were looking at MAP centered around building capacity to generate that data that is used for all of these things. So we have to make sure that we're ensuring the quality of the data that's coming out. So as I said, you know, <laughs> we come back to QMS because it's unavoidable. It forms that foundation. If that data that you want to inform your strategies, to inform your policies, unless it's quality data, then it's what you are, the, the strategies you're going to put out may not be accurate to your scenario. So ensuring that is also key. Further to that is, let me just mention that there is a new ISO standard. There is a new <laughs> ISO standard which has come out at the back of all of what we've done. And so we have to go back and make sure that our systems now conform 
to the standards at the labs. And at the ASLM level, we've already started that. A lot of labs use the WHO slip to checklist um, for, and, and slip to programs, slam to programs for their implementation. And so we've started that process of aligning that program to the ISO requirements. Let me also just mention quickly the issue about how the lab interfaces with the clinic, because like, it came up very strongly and I was listening to the conversation during that. And it was something that, to be honest, when we were also implementing QMS in the lab, we were thinking about, I think we need to strengthen that both ways. You know, the, when QMS first started, we went into all these initiatives because we realized that a lot of times in terms of strengthening diagnostics, the labs in the many of our countries were pushed down. And so to be able to have a, a quality data from the lab that was also informing diagnostics and decision making on patient care, we needed to bring the labs up. And the question is in the process of doing so, have we also now, are we also now making sure that that collaboration to make sure that that data from the lab you know, both ways between the, cl the cl clinic and the, and the lab, that that interface is there on how to adequately use all this quality data that we're now generating from what we're doing. And so the, the question is there, and um, it, it's, it, it was a good one, I have to say. But we have to do this um, because we will continue to generate data, whether it's for diagnosis, whether it's for surveillance from the lab. And so we have to ensure that the data has a standard of quality. We also talked about the NLQF, which is really about now systemizing that um, the QMS programs. We, we cannot, if, 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 if ASLM is um, implementing QMS, we cannot do it for every single lab in every country. Countries have to take ownership of the process and they have to develop programs that then we support because when that is that when it is with that approach can we ensure sustainability because you are saying this is what we want this is how we want to do it this is the resources and infrastructure we are going to assign to get it done this is the uh, personnel the people who are over going to oversee and monitor and this is how we this is the plan we have put in place to ensure the sustainability in the medium to long term. And in all the years that we've been implementing quality management and laboratory system improvement, that has been the one component that we're still behind on, is taking ownership of the process through our policies, our strategic plans. One of the issues, let me just mention this, that we faced when we look at sustainability to us, why do labs not sustain the gains that, you know, when you get a lab accredited, accredited, most of the time, if you go back four, five years down the line, they have not been able to maintain or retain that accreditation. Why? If you go and use the slip to checklist and you build systems, we're not able to sustain them. Why? And it comes back to the fact that a lot of these are driven by external funders, like programs. And when we go, what happens? Everything stops because there has, that, that transition to country ownership hasn't happened. And even where there is a mandate, because a lot of the times when we go to countries to implement, you go, you, you, you meet with the relevant um, government personnel, you are given approval to implement, but without policy and mandate to say you must do this as a lab under our sector, it's very difficult after the fact for people to continue. And it, I mean, it, we are talking about the lab, but it's in everything. That's why we have laws and policies to make sure that people do what they need to do. So we need to, to ensure that moving forward, we can really look at how we transition to country developed and owned programs that we are then supporting. Um, and I've already talked about this, so I'll just, my apologies, the screen has um, gone off. Then as was also mentioned, let me go back one slide. Hello? It's freezing. Okay, so I'll just continue to talk and hopefully it will come up. So as Dr. Pascal mentioned, we also want to look at how we can strengthen collaboration between us and the country grants to look at strengthening the National Diagnostic Network. 
What does it currently look like? There was a lot of discussion yesterday. I had a lot of comments about equity. It was mentioned about the equity of bacteriology testing. You know, where, who are the reference labs? Who are the Sentinel sites? Where are they? And are they adequate and well facilitated and capacitated to serve the areas where they are? And so if we want to make sure that across our countries, and they may vary from country to country, that we are getting the data that can inform national decision making, then we have to show, ensure that across, there was a comment yesterday that, talks, that talked about the fact that a lot of the data from MAP, or which was shared globally, came from one or two labs. So you could argue about the representativeness of the data across the country. So how do we look at making sure that we can capacitate from the top down or the bottom up in, in, in a way that is sustainable, that we can ensure that at every level we are contributing, collecting data that is being fed into AMR national surveillance systems. And if we're looking at uh, the standard which has been set through the Africa CDC RISLNet, which is a regional integrated surveillance and laboratory network, which has some requirements to say, if you're a national reference lab, if you are a sentinel site, these are the systems, this is the capacity that you must have to be able to fulfill the job of a reference lab or a surveillance site. Are the labs in that, who are currently in our countries generating that data meeting that standard? So ideally we would like to use this particular standard to, to, to designate the labs and, and to build their capacity to be able to be designated um, within Rizonet. So that's it, no, nothing major, <laughs> but very important work that we would like to do. And the question for you, for we would like to ask you and for you to help us to look at the way forward is to say, what are your key priorities under this, these activities, right? Under these activities, what are your key priorities? That may differ from country to country, but what are your focuses? What are the things? And you know, when you look across the countries from the, the feedback that will come, you will find some cross-cutting themes, cross-cutting areas for, of priority. What uh, further experience and capacity does ASLM and partners have to further contribute to phase two based on these priorities as well? Because maybe there are things here you think, you, you guys should have looked at that in phase one around these areas and you didn't. And we think that you should prioritize these, these actions as well, right? And then how can we do it better? We've discussed this, I know, in detail, but for each and every grant, there are specific activities we're discussing. And so you may be engaging with certain stakeholders at certain levels, which are different. And so as we, we talk about strengthening the AMRCC to coordinate as well, how, how can we in EQ Africa for our activities look at how we engage with the country, how we align and coordinate with the country grants? Because we know, especially for EQ Africa, that there was a lot of cross-cutting themes with the country grants and the regional grants. We want to be able to look at how we leverage our capacity. We're, we're, we're one, if you think about it, we're, we're funded by one body. It, it, it shouldn't, uh, be my goal and it's not our goal to say we want to do this exclusively. If we go to a country and the country has a country grant and they're doing EQA activities on the ground in the facilities, maybe where EQA Africa some, can support is by doing a, a TOT, right? So we can say that in a country you need uh, auditors for the lab. We are going to train 10 people in your country as master trainers who you can then incorporate, take in the country and use to scale down that training, right? So what can we leverage as us as the, at, at, at the regional level to support your country program? That is what we want to do. If we collaborate with a country grant, it must have been, how can we support you? Because on the ground, as I said, we can't cover everybody. But if the country is owning the program with the country grant, there is more that can be done. And that is what we want to do. We want to ensure that we can expand and really make sure that we are having an impact 
and work closely moving forward. So these are our main questions that we would like you to discuss and help us to look at in ways that we can move forward and have an approach that makes sure that whatever we're doing benefits the country in the long term. And that's it for my presentation. Any questions? <laughs> Is there an additional mic, or you can speak through the... Ah, thank you very much. Uh, this is very good. Yeah, uh, if you could put back the questions, if possible. Sure. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, what, uh, bullet number two. I'm drawing this back from, I think if I recall very well, the meeting we had in Johannesburg, was it Johannesburg? When we were coming up with this, there was a discussion that uh, I think from most of the country representatives proposing in-country capacity building for EQA production for microbiology. And the discussion was around leveraging on the low-hanging fruits uh, I, I like referring to low-hanging fruits because they are easy to grab. You don't have to put in a lot. And now I'm happy that that's where you are driving us. Yeah, uh, we, we, I had a discussion with uh, Olga. We benefited so much from the NICD uh, EQA panels, but going forward, the discussion was that we must build in-country capacity for sustainability. I'm very happy that we all know that countries are different capacities. And in all these countries, the structures are almost the same. There is, they are, there is a national reference lab at the national level. At home, we have already engaged in producing our, our panels, beginning with gram staining low-hanging fruits, and then start testing and sending them to the Sentinel site, but to, the, to the sites in the network, including the private sector. And not only gram staining, including also some specific organisms to check whether they are able to identify and then give them feedback reports. So for sustainability, I think this is key. And also, the SLAMTA program has created a pool of, uh, of, of certifiers, of assessors, of auditors. Now, if we bring these auditors as a resource on top of the QAS uh, team we have at national level, I think we will have created a lot of national capacity for sustainability. Rather than just only saying we are coming into train, we are coming to train, it creates a lot of duplication of efforts. And then I am sure you have to feel the bit of resentment because you have not let countries own their problems and own their solutions. I submit. Useful input if you want to respond. Thank you for that. So let me address the second part. I think even with SLAMTA, et cetera, with the training that they were doing was about sustainability um, and to ensure that the country can build their own pool of people that can take the program forward. The reason why we continue on the ground to provide that training is not because necessarily we come in and say we want to do this, but because even, even now outside of Left Femmingfan, the request comes to the countries to us. Now, all the time when we are um, training, it's about building sustainability, right? So, um, as I said, if we go to recently, I believe we were in um, one of Seychelles or something, training slips to auditors. It's so the country can utilize those auditors to perform audits of the quality management systems in their labs. Um, so our aim is always to build national capacity to do what you need to do. What is lacking is what we call, is what I refer to as the national program, is what is this program going to look like? And most importantly, how are you going to resource it? Because the resource section of it 
is, is really important. How are you going to build the infrastructure to implement and to sustain these programs? Because a lot of the time, that is why we also keep coming back to external funding and to programs, because we have a program on paper, but in our, in our policies and in our strategic plans, we haven't actually allocated resources to support it. And, and a lot of the time when programs come in, because we can't cover everyone, we select specific clubs and it, became, it be, doesn't become necessarily a national program, but a site specific program. So that is what we're trying, exactly what we're trying to do through the NLQF, is to support countries to say, how do you build a national program and allocate the necessary resources that can be complemented with external funding to implement quality and to sustain it? Well, the second question about EQA is very well um, noted. We do realize that, well, obviously, you know, if you run an EQA program, you want it to cover everything. But at the moment, we are, we've been aiming for the National Reference Labs and Sentinel sites. But we know that a lot of countries, capacity further down, especially most of the labs, the, the majority of labs are in the lower tiers, and they also need some kind of EQA. So the aim of the training and qualification framework is to build your capacity to be able to establish those programs as well. We, we, we know we can't cover everybody. Thank you uh, for drawing our attention. I think some key phrase came up during the presentation. I don't know whether I can rephrase it this way. Sustainability and scalability through country ownership and leadership. I think this is what we've been hitting all along, that we must ensure that there's sustainability, scalability, through country ownership and country leadership. And I think if we're able to live here, be able to establish the how of this, I'm sure we'll be able to do justice to this after the presentation and gathering. Uh, we want to have uh, from Nigeria, Prof. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> so I think the ISO that is used for the animal health labs is the ISO 17025. So I think it needs to be. So 17025 hasn't, the new version hasn't come out yet. Yeah. So currently that's fine. But one for, so with with the release of one five one eight nine, we anticipate that seventeen zero two five will also be released soon. We know, but it, it hasn't, not yet, not yet. It hasn't landed yet, but it's coming. So now, one thing we must also be reflecting is after all these investments in the past in capacity building, I don't know what we've done on a resource audit of our country to see what we have so we can use them. I think that's one of the issues. I think we just enjoy to go through the training, training, training. But if you ask on the ground, I saw a lot of data that was presented here uh, for training on internal audits, several resources. If we have this pool of resources in Africa, I think it is a place to start. And as you said, low hanging fruits are easy to pluck. So let's uh, provide leaders, let's do a resource audit of the infrastructure resources we have, the human, the uh, capacity that has been built within our countries, uh, the training they've benefited from, benefited from, and see how we can deploy these ones. So that those who are benefited from can easily be polished and then used to strengthen. So I'm happy about the proposal to use the SLAMTA, people who benefit from the SLAMTA training Instead of starting from all over a new crop of people, uh, and that this approaching that way, I'm sure, will be one of the low-hanging fruits we can we can uh, look at. We have any other contributions? Any other questions? Any experience to share from your country in terms of how you've benefited from the EQA so far? All right. Right. So, if we have forgotten everything, remember <laughs> this: <laughs> that we need one. 
I hope it's not dot com. <laughs> For those who came late, I'm, I say after a meal in Ghana we have what to call dot com. <laughs> this is what we call dot com in Ghana. So I'm sure dot com is setting it so the blood flow to refresh the brain is it's a, a little low. But let's remember uh, that at least sustainability and scalability. True country ownership and country what leadership. Kindly proceed. Yes, uh, what? Thank you very much. So mine is just a, a comment and maybe just to spark a discussion about this. So when we're talking about sustainability, and uh, here I'm referring to proficiency testing schemes, one of the things that is important is to create um, demand. And um, just maybe the policy makers and the um, regulatory agencies in the, in the group today, um, at what point or are we having discussions um, that are geared towards making participation in proficiency testing mandatory in Africa? Is that a discussion that we feel that uh, we should have at some point? Thank you. So, so the NLQF mentions mandatory EQA participation uh, that as one of the things that should be in the policies. I mean, if you look at any developed system that we, with the systems we look up to and we talk about, as per, you know, the uh, labs are mandated to implement quality and to participate in EQA. They go hand in hand. Uh, doing, doing one without the other doesn't really achieve, uh, well, you can do quality management systems, but EQA especially must be, must have, be grounded within QMS. It's very important. Thank you. Okay. Let me proceed with you. Just wondering, um, for the EQA, which norm are you producing? Because I know that for the veterinary well, lab, what we use is uh, ISO 17,025. Uh, and my lab happened to have been accredited, not for RAM, not for MIR, for antimicrobial resistance, but for other diseases, uh, for CBPP and the uh, best depictive dominant, uh, using ELISA and the uh, PCR. Uh, but we were thinking to, you know, uh, extend the scope to other uh, tests, bacteriological tests, but uh, we had some few problems. So I'm just asking the question um, because uh, I think for the medical field, it's like medical lab, they use a different uh, norm, but for those in the veterinary, it's ISO 17,025. Yes, exactly. So all the labs that we, when we are implementing, we implement in per the applicable standard. So all the labs who have been accredited, the animal health labs, food safety environment is 17,025. All right, so if there's no other, if we will still come for discussions after the breakup session. I would want to ask for us to give uh, Beatrice an applause, just to appreciate the brief and uh, straight to the point presentation. You can always trust her to be on point, right? So I want to invite uh, Edwin to uh, take us to the the session that makes us to break into the groups. Same as before, all right, so that makes it very easy. So let's break into our groups. I hope we've all taken the questions and uh, we have sufficient time from what I see to digest whatever uh, has been given to us. So let's uh, reflect deeply in our groups and be able to provide answers to to the question that have been put to us. The same groups, the same groups, the same, the same hall, the same group, the same hall. <laughs> so we, at the time, we, we're supposed to be here. We're supposed to be back here. It's supposed to be 75 minutes, two, 18. So by, uh, it's one, it's, let me look at, yeah.
to move forward in terms of EQA within the continent and within our countries, from regional to national ownership. We want to uh, acknowledge the presence of Group 1, look, Group 1, Tanz Tanzania, uh, that's, that's Group 3. Uh, you are ready to begin, all right. So let's give Group 3 an opportunity to start. Okay, once you are here, the, the early bird catches the worm. So you are welcome, you introduce yourself and your countries, those who were part of it, and then you proceed. Thank you, good afternoon. My name is Dr. Witness from Tanzania. I'm working at the Ministry of Health and I'll present on behalf of group number three. Um, I'll go through the question number one and number three um, and I'll share the response. So it was about the key priorities that should be included, but also um, how can the how can we do better in terms of country engagement and the alignment and, and the coordination part? So the few points that we thought should be added include number one, to increase scope of EQ, EQA priority programs to cover more areas and enroll more sentinel sites that were not in phase one implementation. Number two was cascading EQA programs to include the other sectors just to mention animals, environment, and the food producing sectors. Number three, there should be a clear cut specification on what the country grant can do and what the region grant can support in order to complement each other. And number four is establishment of engaging modality for other partners to support EQA and other AMR interventions. And another point was to strengthen country ownership of EQA intervention by incorporating components of EQA in the regulatory and the profession bodies. And on the part of what further experience and capacity does ASLM and partners have to further contribute to phase two, we had two main points. One was to strengthen advocates in identifying key people who will represent the about priorities during bilateral fund application. And another point was to support the existing country-specific EQA program laboratory performance and the competence of personnel. That's what we had for group three. Thank you. That was apt and straight to the point. So we want to, if group two is here, yes, come closer. You introduce yourself and your team members. Thank you. Yes, uh, uh, good, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Zimbo Kawuke Bakari. I'm a clinical pharmacist from Tanzania. A reporter from group two, uh, it is the Sadeki countries. South Africa. <laughs> so, um, in uh, Group 2, we have a discussion on the part of the key priorities, what should be uh, involved, and uh, the question was, uh, what are the, your key priorities under, the, under, under, under these activities? The first is to strengthen the QMS bacteriology, expansion of QMS quality results, coordinate uh, and uh, advocate on a platform on, on the country in QMS desk to make the all activities relating to quality management system to be operated under one under one roof so that to avoid the duplications of our activities uh, within the ministry or within the institutions. That was the first and uh, the second question is what are the further experience and the capacity does ICLM and the part in the other parties have to further contribute to phase two? based on the, on, on the priorities. The first point was uh, do mentorship, training, and uh, other capacity buildings, especially in bacteriology, generate quality data and utilize them, and uh, also uh, bacteriology lab capacitations buildings and the provision of resources in, in bacteriology, including reagents. And uh, the issues was about the data generated 
should involve the it should involve the epidemiologist in analysis, interpretations, and the presentation of data, so that to generate the information which is very relevant and well understood, ensure availabilities and the clear activities in MR surveillance plan, especially in, in the research, to provide the feedback and involve the, uh, all stakeholders related on the antimicrobial uh, resistance in both in one health aspect. Strengthen antimicrobial stewardship and uh, diagnostic stewardship to make the strategies based on the data available. Uh, quality management teams needed is take, uh, to, to, to be standardized, especially for data collection should be standardized. Uh, so to standardize data collection tools to have the, to have the standard variables uh, so that to avoid also duplication, but to also will enforce the, also the issue of the quality of data. And this is one of the role of epidemiologists to be involved in antimicrobial stewardship team. And the lastly was uh, uh, to use the uh, subject, subject, uh, is, uh, subject uh, matter, matter expert models. And this we, we went in our group, went countrywide to, to see the implementation of use of subject matter expert models on the implementations of uh, uh, quality management systems. So in, from Malawi perspective, it is very, it's very well working, and they have, and is well integrated in the system. Zambia it is available, but it is at maturity level. And, it, 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 and it, there is one emphasis which was being uh, provided from the Zambia uh, group uh, uh, delegate. Uh, the subject matter expert also we have to integrate one health aspect, not only for human health uh, alone, but also we, we're going to have, we should have the expert also in animal environment and others. In Iswatin it's well working and uh, it also it needs some integrations in country grant. Zimbabwe is available, uh, the subject uh, is, is, is being available and is well practiced. Thank you. Thank you very much, Group 2, for uh, your apt presentation. We'll go to Group 1. Is Group 1 ready? Shall we welcome them, especially the leading group? Okay, thank you very much. So, so thank you very much. My name is Shafal and I'm from Senegal, and I will be good give you the feedback from the work from the group one. So the group one was represented by Senegal, the Frankfurt country, Senegal, Cameroon, and Gabon. And uh, I, will, uh, I would like to invite you to use the translator because I would like to do my speech in French. <laughs> we are in democracy, and uh, we need to... <laughs> So, uh, concernant donc le travail qui a été mené par le, le groupe One, nous avons réfléchi donc autour de quatre points qui sont des points prioritaires et nous avons essayé donc de travailler sur l'expansion des activités euh, du programme Equa Africa. Le deuxième point avait porté donc sur la formation et la capacitation euh, au niveau des pays pour la production et la distribution des panels, euh, tout en respectant donc les, les normes et Ensuite, il y a eu le, tra euh, le troisième point qui a porté donc sur la, le, le système de management de la qualité, notamment le plan national qualité. Et en dernier lieu, nous avons essayé donc de regarder la possibilité de faire comment pérenniser donc ce programme-là, et également donc euh, la représentativité au niveau de ASLM, au niveau de chaque pays. Concernant donc le premier point euh, portant donc sur l'expansion du programme Equa Africa au niveau du pays. Chaque pays a ses réalités, mais il faudra retenir en gros que ce qu'il y a lieu de retenir ici, c'est donc le, le renforcement de, 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 de l'existant avec une capacitation des différents sites avant de penser donc à l'extension. Si on prend donc l'exemple du Sénégal et le Cameroun qui ont eu à participer au niveau de la phase 1 de ce programme-là, nous avons démarré pour le Sénégal avec euh, quatre laboratoires et il y a une extension de, 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 la, de la distribution de ces panels jusqu'à jusqu couvrir donc 14 laboratoires qui ont eu à participer au, au dernier cycle. Et c'est la même situation au niveau du Cameroun où on avait démarré avec 9 sites et nous avons fini donc avec, 4, avec 17 sites. 
Mais dans tous les cas, il y a lieu de relever donc parfois qu'il y a quelques difficultés à assurer la, 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 euh, la pérennisation ou bien la régularité, autant pour moi, de la participation de ces, de ces, de ces cycles-là, au niveau de ces cycles-là. Pourquoi Parce que parfois les problèmes sont... Euh, les, 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 les sites sont confrontés à quelques problèmes d'approvisionnement en, en réactif. Donc, euh, si par rapport à, cette, à la phase 2, il y a donc lié de capacité davantage les laboratoires à, à, à bien faire les, les PT, mais également à essayer d'élargir ces sites-là au niveau des différents, euh, au niveau, en incluant d'autres sites, notamment le secteur de la santé animale et les autres secteurs comme l'environnement et euh, le secteur de l'alimentation. Concernant donc euh, le Gabon, pour le moment, le Gabon a, a, est confronté à quelques problèmes parce que le, les sites sentinelles n'ont pas encore été identifiés. Le Labo national donc doit faire ce travail d'identification pour permettre au Gabon de participer à ce site-là. Concernant donc le deuxième point portant donc sur la formation des fournisseurs au niveau du pays pour pouvoir faire la production, euh, le Cameroun, tout comme le Gabon, qui sont au niveau de la région centrale de l'Afrique, se sont ont fait un plaidoyer pour pouvoir donc avoir un up sous régional, pour pouvoir faire une, la, la production au niveau local et la distribution, parce que les panels qu'ils reçoivent viennent du Sénégal, et donc ce serait bien à leur niveau qu'ils pu, qu puissent avoir la possibilité de faire la production au niveau sous régional et la distribution. Euh, en ce qui concerne donc le plan national qualité, il y a pour le moment des politiques qui, sont, qui ont été... La politique qualité a été produite et validée au niveau du Cameroun, mais c'est le plan national qui doit... L'implémentation du plan national qui n'est pas encore effective. Sur ce, donc, euh, il y a plusieurs points qui ont été euh, intégrés dans ce plan national-là, qui prend entre compte... Euh, en compte donc euh, l'implémentation des protocoles, la mise en place d'une agence nationale de normalisation. Et au niveau du Sénégal, il y a déjà une norme qui est la norme 1589 qui est obligatoire pour les laboratoires de référence. Mais si on descend à un niveau beaucoup plus bas, l'implémentation de cette norme-là risque de poser problème. Et ce qui fait que donc euh, il y a lieu de réfléchir comment embarquer ces labos à des niveaux beaucoup plus bas. Et, et pour le, le Cameroun, comme on l'a dit tantôt, il y a une politique et une, un plan national qui est déjà rédigé. Il reste donc la validation qui doit se, se faire. Et concernant donc la, la, les, les next steps, on a, vu, on a dit que donc l'ASLM, ce serait bien que l'ASLM formalise donc le fait que les représentants qui sont au niveau des différents pays. Euh, C'est le cas, par exemple, du Cameroun et du Gabon où il y a un, un représentant, mais il faudra donc le formaliser pour qu'il soit donc l'ambassadeur ou la, le porte-étendard de, de ASLM au niveau de ces pays-là. Euh, pour le cas du Sénégal, il faudra établir ce point de contact-là parce que ce n'est pas encore existant. Donc voilà les, 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 les réflexions qu'on a eu à, à mener au niveau du groupe. Merci. Thank you very much, uh, Gabon, Cameroon, and uh, Senegal for your report. We would want to hear finally from Group 4, Nigeria, Ghana, Bangladesh, and uh, Sierra Leone. You're welcome, Doc. Thank you. So my name once again is Sati Ngulugun from Nigeria. I'm representing Group 4, comprising of Nigeria, Sierra Leone, Ghana, and Bangladesh. So I'm presenting on their behalf. So for key priorities under the, these activities, what the group came up with as follows, to expand the EQA to include all national reference laboratories and the Sentinel sites, and also extend it to the uh, subnational level laboratories, as the second tier laboratories in countries, 
and also to extend it to universities, especially the uh, University Teaching Hospital Bacteriology Laboratories and so research institutes, and all to internalize it and to also domesticate it. So it's very key that policies are developed uh, so that they are implemented. Uh, the, another point is to also uh, <clears throat> involve the human resource uh, department so that uh, people to have a national database for those that have been trained so that any time if uh, these people are required, they know where they are and they can be mobilized to other facilities that need their services. Uh, another point is to also build local EQA capacity. And it's very key that uh, this is owned uh, nationally by countries and uh, uh, improvement is uh, maintained. Uh, another critical and important point is advocacy. It is very key and important that uh, advocacy, you know, is uh, intensified for <coughs> our laboratories to implement the slimter and slipter uh, uh, assessment so that laboratories, you know, key into it. Also to have uh, national standards. You know, all laboratories may not be able to, you know, all undergo international accreditation. But if countries have minimum national standards, then laboratories are encouraged to meet those uh, local uh, standards that meets up with uh, at least minimum EQA uh, requirements. Also, there should be national uh, level programs and strategies. Uh, like it was mentioned earlier in the morning, we need to own these things. And if we are going to own them, then we must have a strategy in place nationally so that we maintain uh, this uh, QMS and EQA. And so it's very key that we maintain a national strategies for EQA and uh, accreditation. Um, Another point is to also have an inter-laboratory uh, comparison, and this is tied up to uh, maintaining, you know, having a national uh, standards. You know, laboratories that are high up there can be, you know, can also enlist, you know, other laboratories that are lower so that, you know, they improve their capacity for uh, testing and identification and also antimicrobial resistance test. Um, for point two, a further experience and capacity for uh, ASLM, um, the group came up that ASLM should uh, leverage on the country grants. As we, uh, has been said, you know, the country grants have done uh, a lot. So the regional grants need to leverage on this so that we don't have uh, duplications and that will really help. And this will be based on country priorities. So each country should come up with uh, its priorities, and then when these uh, priorities are harnessed and shared with the regional grants and then the national grants, then they can be properly aligned. <clears throat> and so countries are also encouraged to prioritize their plans, because if we don't prioritize, then you know, it will be so open that we, it's difficult to, to actually, you know, implement some of these strategies if they are not well prioritized. So it is key and important that uh, countries prioritize what they need, and then it will be easy for, you know, the uh, partners to key in and support. And then for point three, uh, how we can do and get it better is to you know, collaborate to get the involvement and support of all the critical stakeholders, especially the One Health platform, and then to also review essential uh, diagnostic list because if that is not done, then it will be difficult to, uh, to, to prioritize and then to implement uh, some of these things. 
So it's uh, very important that all the sectors work together and work together harmoniously. So that's our uh, presentation. Thank you. Shall we give a bigger applause to all the groups? So far, we've enjoyed active, conscious participation, at least yesterday and today. And I'm sure this session would not be different. I'm sure we heard the presentations. And uh, we want to open the floor now uh, for uh, some of us who probably, for sake of time, did not have the opportunity to make our points uh, forcefully. Or probably we made them and they were rejected at the group level. Probably when you submit them here, they may be. You know, in this, we always have a minority view. When you are voted out, you can still make your view. That minority view can be taken on board. Uh -huh. So we are open to that. Contributions, uh, inputs, and maybe walking here, something flash your mind that you probably because of dot com you could not <laughs> put it so you have a second chance to to be able to present this so the floor is opened to our discussions uh, i hope we could project the questions so that people could be reflecting with the questions it can you help us just put the questions on At times, when you read something three, four times, the meaning changes. So it's possible. <laughs> so we're open for discussions. Any input, any experiences, country experiences that you want to share with us. At times, when experiences come, they sort of reinforce whatever you are discussing. Those of us who benefited, at least from the phase one, or you have something too. There's something which is running through. Even though we are talking about sustainability, there's something which has come up very forcefully, and that is maintenance and consolidation of this one. Okay? I don't know whether we saw it running through. Uh, so that must come uh, first in my list of things that we need to consolidate what we were able to achieve in phase one. I've seen it running through the need for us to uh, uh, ensure that all those that benefited, uh, others should come on board and then expand it to animal health, to uh, environmental health, to cascade it to the lower levels in terms of district levels from regional levels, teaching hospitals, uh, just for us to be able to do whatever we're doing phase one on a larger scale. I think it came up very strongly during the presentations and beyond that, the issue of sustainability also came up as a concern. And when we are talking of sustainability, we are talking of it in terms of human socio-economic, we don't start something that we cannot fund, or that we don't start something that economically we cannot what, sustain, uh, or socially to bring a lot of what, uh, backlash, or environmentally to be harmful to whatever we do. So it also came up very strongly. Uh, any other inputs that you think we should re-emphasize? Because as we talk, Certain resolutions are being penned now by the organizers. So this gives us an opportunity to re-emphasize them. Uh, so the floor is opened. If you don't talk, I would uh, come to your table and I will identify you, especially somebody who didn't talk the whole workshop yesterday and today. <laughs> yes. You know, when we were uh, young, we used to, uh, uh, anytime you did something wrong, a, a cane will wait for you. No matter where you go, where you come, you meet it. So at times, it's good to go and take it, your lash. You know that you've taken your part, right? But as you keep running away, it will still wait for you. So I'll go to our host country, 
uh, Collins, kindly. <laughs> I knew you were coming to me. <laughs> yeah, I think one issue that came up in our group was that uh, the human sector, uh, there's a lot of focus on the human sector, even in EQA, Africa, and we need to bring in the other sectors. But we also need to understand that uh, in terms of investment, uh, the human sector has received a lot of funding so that they have capacity both at national and all through the tire, while for the animal and the environmental, we need to understand that maybe the labs are maybe up to regional, so that context needs to be taken in, into account. And also to expand to the environmental labs. I think we are told that only three in the whole of Africa are participating in EQA Africa. So those are issues that we need to take into consideration. Thanks. Very important point. I think a similar point was made before we went on the break that there's a need for us to consciously give a target. That we say, this country, let's see whether you can bring three on board and then you report on it. But if we leave it loose, uh, we may not be able to succeed. So, and the word uh, uh, Beatrice used in the morning was uh, deliberate, or is what? Deliberate, intentional, intentional. We must intentionally give targets to be able to resolve this matter. If not, uh, any other input or experience? Yes. Okay. So uh, I would like to add something. Uh, if you look at uh, regarding the sustainability of this program, the most challenge is uh, the cost of uh, uh, the production of PT. And uh, besides the support uh, from the the, 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 the fund, it will be a big challenge to, to make sustainability for this, uh, for this program. That's why I think we have to, 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 to have the commitment from uh, the country, at the country level, to, to, to facilitate the, the sustainability of the program. For example, uh, regarding the, uh, uh, for the quality management system, if you like to, to have uh, accreditation, it should be important for its lab to participate regularly for this kind of program. And so uh, I think uh, uh, if we use this approach, we will have at least the, the, the possibility to have some uh, Sentinel lab who will uh, regularly participate this, this, on this program. And uh, if you have a, uh, a relevant result, we can present and share it to uh, to the other lab and uh, push them to participate uh, at this program. Thank you. Thank you very much. 40 countries, two regional labs, seven other regions, 132 focal points in terms of the EQA. We are expanding and going forward. We want to move from the regional levels down to the national levels. And some key points I have gleaned from some of our discussions that I may want to share with us. That one, there's an ish, a need for us to consolidate what we are already doing. I think some of us have implemented it, but somehow to consolidate means we need to firm it. So I think that message has come out very, very clearly. Then beyond that, we need to look at the issues of sustainability and scalability. I remember before we went on the break, we said we must do it through what? Country ownership and leadership. Very, very crucial. And that means that we must develop homegrown solutions, homegrown solutions, national solutions, so that we can avoid some of the duplications and not allow the tail to work the dog. Right. Then beyond that, we also agreed that there is a need for us to have proper resource mapping because a lot of investment has happened. And if we are able to do resource audit and then be able to see how we can deploy them, it can be a very good low hanging fruit for us to consider. Now, something is coming and running through all these discussions. 
that we cannot have an effective EQA system without an effective QMS. I think people start with EQA, but they end with QMS. <laughs> that means we must look at that very, very strongly. And that means that we must uh, be able to look at put in place all our national policies and quality frameworks that are needed to further ground whatever we are doing in terms of EQA so that it doesn't become a discretionary matter, becomes mandatory. And we also got information that some countries have accreditation services or boards. And that is a good place to start. When these services or accreditation bodies begin to make issues of accreditation a little mandatory and enforceable, uh, at least it gives us the opportunity to get management committed and that adds to the issue of sustainability. So we must develop our national standards. And there's a need for us to harmonize what happens at the region and also at the national level. And further strengthen the role of the uh, AMRCCs. Uh, so I think these are some of the things we talked about uh, during our sessions. And I would want to uh, invite my co-chairman for what Prof. Seni. and to give him the opportunity to uh, to give you the opportunity to say some concluding remarks uh, before we draw down the curtain. So thank you very much. Uh, I think it has been, it has been a, uh, the day has been well spent, right? Yes, and um, so let's give a round of applause, at least to four. I was, just, I was actually mentioning <laughs> I was actually mentioning I have like four groups. So if you if I forget your group, you would forgive us. So the first one should be a round of applause for the presenters. The second one will be again a round of applause for facilitators, chairs, and laboratories. The third one will be for the secretariat and the IT team for coordination. And the last one, but not least, to the two co-chairs. <laughs> so thank you very so before we leave our IT team have prepared for us just a two minute video clip for reflecting how the day went on hey, this is an important meeting because we need to continue to discuss how we can support and strengthen the capacity in Africa in terms of uh, combating this uh, silent pandemic of uh, antimicrobial resistance we are here because this has become a global emergency, no longer a threat. And I was looking at some uh, recent statistics uh, and they demonstrate that we have an emergency indeed. Uh, some estimates are that over 700,000 deaths are happening annually uh, due to MRI. They estimate that by 2050, uh, if we don't do anything about MRI, we are going to have up to 10 million uh, deaths occurring annually. So the impact uh, to us socially and economically cannot be underestimated. The, the SLM has led and, and continues to lead uh, the initiatives to improve laboratory systems and infrastructure in Africa to respond to both present and future challenges such as AMR strong high quality laboratory systems uh, that produce data uh, through antimicrobial susceptibility testing on microorganisms causing uh, diseases across health and other sectors such as animal, food and environment. Sectors are essential uh, to these efforts under the One Health umbrella. We are here today to take stock in terms of our accomplishments, uh, discuss uh, any challenges, any obstacles and also lessons learned. And finally, we need to decide how we move forward. That's it. So that's like a series. So that's a version one. So maybe we'll have another version tomorrow. So on behalf of my co-chair, we sincerely thank you for your participation, for your input throughout the day. 
And we wish you to see you again tomorrow, same place, same hour. Good evening.